Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for that beautiful rendition of the national anthem. Um, without further ado, I would like to once again welcome everyone to Government and Tech Summit 2022. The GATT Summit is jointly organized by TechNext, one of Africa's foremost um, tech media platform, and Ripples Nigeria, multi-award winning multimedia online news platform. To kickstart today's event, I would like to welcome the CEO and co-founder of TechNext, David Afolayon, for his welcome address. Welcome, David. Let's put our hands together for him, please. A young man doing great things in the tech sector. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Lagos. Good morning, Africa. You're welcome to GATT Summit 2022. And on behalf of all the organizers, I want to say a special thank you to the governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sonwolu, um, ably represented by a special advisor on innovation and technology, Mr. Tubosun Alaki, the DG of MIDDA, Dr. Inua Abdullahi, and all the other speakers and special guests that are here and are still on their way to the GATT Summit 2022. We deeply appreciate your spending your time to be with us on such a time as this. And we want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. Now, there is no gain saying in the fact that there is an unspoken, unremitting tension between Nigerians and their leaders as it is across the world, between innovators and regulators, between leaders and the led and between the future and the present and the past that is yet unyielding. Indeed, leaders are concerned about maintaining order and protecting institutions. That is what we voted them in to do. And that is what they've always done up to this point. But there is now a young generation, a young generation of innovators that are interested in forward-thinking ideas, forward-thinking systems that will guarantee transformational experiences and make sure that there is prosperity for everybody. And herein lies the tension. We cannot move forward by remaining where we have always been. So there is a tension between the now generation and the generation of the past. At such times that, as these, what do we usually do? The young generation stays where it is most comfortable, and each side keep their toughs. They speak the language they understand, they use the platform that they are used to, and they speak the tones that is convenient for their generations. But there are other times when the youths are heard, such as the time when they deviate from their conversational, conventional social media conversations to go to the streets to make their voices heard, like the NSAS protest. But at such times, leaders have also responded with the tools that they are conventionally used to, such as more violence, regulations, and promises that might never come to fruition. But we, rem we need to remember that the youths are not our enemies, and the leaders are not our enemies. Perhaps there is a need for us to talk Perhaps there is a need for us to sit across the table and talk to each other instead of talking about each other. And that is the reason why we are here. And we are here for two important reasons. One, there is a need for us to communicate. As John Joseph Powell said, honest, open communication is the only street that leads us to the real world. We then began to grow as never before and once we are on this road, happiness cannot be far away. We can protest and we can fight and we can restrict as much as we like, but our nation, our continent cannot move in the right direction if we do not tell each other what needs to be said and listen to each other. The second reason why we need to speak to each other is that many of our leaders today 
we are agitators some years ago. Some of them fought against the military regime. Some of them protested during June 12. And what we have seen across the years is that great agitators do not necessarily become great leaders. So those of us that are agitating today, we are going to be leaders in a very short time. The question is, are we conversant with the challenges that these leaders face? How are we going to quickly step into their shoes if we do not know what they are fighting against? As Frederick Nietzsche would say, he will fight with monster, must take care, lest he therefore becomes a monster himself. And if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss will gaze back. Besides, there is a real need for us to exchange back turns and to begin to talk about a smooth transition that needs to happen between those who are presently in control and those who aspire to be in control tomorrow. We do not need to get to the office to realize that the way things actually are. One of the key ingredients for preparation is knowing what the leaders often know but cannot share with us, and that's the reason why we are speaking today. While we banter and wake up to violence on social media every day and every time, there is a time for us to talk about national importance so that while the world is moving pretty fast, we would not be left behind. So today, Tech Next, Ripples, and the voice of the people 90.3 FM has put together GAT Summit 2022 to bring the people making the laws today together with the people who are innovating today and who are going to be making the laws tomorrow so that we can discuss the challenges that both parties face and how we can make things better. So today is history and you are a part of it. You are lucky to be a part of it. I am lucky to be a part of it. So once again, I welcome you to history. Let the conversation begin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, David. Um, for our first keynote address, I would like to invite none other than Rufai Oseni, the hard-hitting journalist of Arise TV News, to please introduce the representative of the executive governor of Lagos State. Hopefully, he's going to softly introduce him. Rufai, so let's put our hands together for Rufai as he comes to the stage. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? Great to have all of you here this evening. And I'm not hard eating, am I? I'm not. I mean, I'm just a passionate Nigerian that like to ask passionate questions about the things that passionately concern me. And because I see that there's a lot of greatness in this country, isn't it? If I didn't see greatness, trust me, I would have pushed the Nigerian card so high. I wouldn't, but I see so much greatness. And I see that we have not utilized that greatness. And I see there's a lot of unfinished greatness. And if you wake up every morning and you see that every day, that is a motivating factor for more conversations. And I think in Nigeria, we don't talk enough. We don't talk to ourselves. People talk at people, but they don't talk with each other. And that's why I'm happy about this conference, because it's actually a forum for us to be able to talk with each other. I mean, you can see representatives from the government, from NITDA and the likes, and we are talking with each other. Because really, when you look at it on the other end, we both want the same things. We're not adversaries. We both want the best for one another. Because if tech grows in Nigeria, the government will benefit from it, isn't it? They'll take back big revenues to be able to develop the country. So we are both in this together, and the moment we realize that, we become less antagonistic. And the government too wants the development of young people because when young people develop through tech, you can get a lot of people off the streets, people that are jobless, that are doing nothing, and the country can grow in general. And tech is the future. You remember the good old days? A few young people in their 20s and 30s 
in places like Silicon Valley in America, pushing the envelope. Those people became the likes of Google, the likes of Microsoft, and these boys started up from their garages, but look at what they have become today. Today, Google has got revenue as big as most economies in Africa. And business can actually transform Nigeria. So it is chairs to more partnership. And that's why we have no other person than to give us the keynote for this by having our chief, you know, resident officer in the state because we're actually in this state. The Lagos state governor, but is ably represented by Tuba Swalaki, the essay on tech, innovation, and development to give us a keynote address in this great occasion. Please put your hands together for him. Thank you so much. The governor really wanted to be here, but something came up and he couldn't make it here today. And he extends his uh, apologies. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Rufai. Um, I must say, I agree with him. He's not that hard-hitting. He's very passionate, and I'm a fan of his. So, good morning, everybody. Um, DG Nita, good morning, um, and distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to stand on existing protocol. So, my name is um, Tuboson Alake. I'm the special advisor to the governor of Lagos on innovation and technology. Um, I'm representing the governor here today. He couldn't be here. He wanted to, but um, other duties came up. Um, and so I, I wanted to convey his words uh, to us, um, a topic that was given to us uh, uh, from Tech Next uh, called Regulating for Prosperity, um, the Lagos example. Um, and I'll just be going through uh, some of the words, but I would also be adding um, a few things because um, Lagos, as you well know, uh, is a giant in Nigeria and there are so many things happening. Um, but um, I, I think um, we face many existential challenges today, not just in Lagos, but in Nigeria as a whole. And we are quite bullish about the position of Lagos, not just in Nigeria, but on the African continent. Uh, and so with that, Lagos, you know, with a GDP figure of almost 150 billion US dollars uh, and a population of around 22 million, there exists within Lagos a tremendous amount of potential to deliver on real economic value for its citizens. Lagos's economy is larger than that of Kenya, Ghana, and Ivory Coast. And so Lagos in itself represents the, uh, the economic engine of the entire northern part of sub-Saharan Africa. And so Lagos, if you take Lagos as a country on its own, it will be between the sixth and the eighth largest economy in Africa, right? That's how very important this state is. And, and there's, there exists within Lagos tons of potential, potentials like you seated in this room. But in equal measure are the challenges it presents in relation to socioeconomic management, in terms of demographics, and of course in terms of climate change. Lagos, as it stands today, is about a third of Nigeria's gross domestic product. Of course, with leading sectors in telecoms, finance, real estate, retail, digital technology, and other service sectors. A diverse and educated workforce, a progressive business and entrepreneurial environment, and a relatively stable regulatory environment are major contributors are major contributory factors to the dynamism that exists within Lagos. One of the key factors for driving sustained economic growth, as we all know, is regulation. Getting regulation right, more often than not, constitutes striking the right but sometimes uneasy balance. This balance must be struck between factors such as risk and reward, 
environmental protections versus industrial output, value creating incumbents versus new innovative newcomers, present trade-offs versus future earnings. And so when regulations are being formed, there are tons of factors that one has to look at, right? There are people creating value currently, and there are people coming to disrupt or to change the type of value that is being created. These are some of the uneasy balances that formulation of regulation must take into account. So let me give an example. In cryptos, for instance, questions regulators must need to grapple with include what risks are engendered by currency that is not issued by a central bank. So if we understand the DNA of central banks, right? Central banks are made to protect the financial system. In fact, central banks came out of trouble. Central banks were born out of um, unease, instability. If anybody um, knows about the Great Depression or the financial crisis of night, the stock market crash in 1929, and the Great Depression that followed, you would know that the Federal Reserve in the US was born out of a lot of what happened there as a central regulator to protect investors, to protect the financial markets. And even till today, the Federal Reserve strikes an uneasy balance by you know, either reducing interest rates or keeping interest rates high depending of, on where the economy is or depending on how they want to stimulate it. So they're always trying to strike a balance. And so there are major trade-offs because if you raise interest rates, you want to cool inflation, but at the same time, people will not be able to borrow. And so there'll be less uh, economic activity. That's trade-offs. So some people are gonna be out of a job, but at least you will cool inflation and people will be able to still afford some certain things. And so regulation, getting regulation right, requires a balancing act. The same thing if you look at companies like Uber, for instance, uh, and the um, Taxi Association in New York City, for instance, right? And, you know, the loss of jobs of one sector and the innovating of, another, of that same sector. Innovation is very good, but at the same time, when those people that are out of a job now come and complain to government that, you know, you need to protect us from this. So the government has to spend to retrain, to do certain things, to be able to keep at least the economy chugging, people in jobs. And so there's a lot of striking the balance across different industries. And I think we as citizens have to understand what regulators face, the decisions. So the question I would ask is, if you were the central bank governor, what would be your approach? What tools will you have in your arsenal to be able to strike that balancing act? So, a, so a, a currency that is not issued by a central government, right, does not have certain safety uh, guards with it. So how would you regulate that? So let me tell you what the central bank is looking at. In 2019, for instance, about 300 million US dollars was stolen from 12 major crypto hacks, right? Now, that is people's real earned money, right? Are there any protections? Today, if, say, a bank fails, the Nigerian Depositors Insurance Corporation insures your deposits up to 250,000 naira. But if you get robbed from a crypto exchange, you are on your own. And so the regulators have to study what kinds of safety nets they must put in some of these new technologies that are advancing. So it's also important for innovators to understand the complex legislative um, uh, issues that relate to these things so that, in fact, you could even walk to the central bank and say, you know what? Guys, I know what you are going through. Let me take the risk, right? I will do a sandbox for you 
so that you can get the results from testing these new cryptocurrencies or these new currencies. Your understanding of what they face might even lend you to be of more value to them. So it's very important we understand some of these complexities. Right? Um, in medical science, for instance, how do you ensure the unintended consequences of gene editing does not tamper with the fundamental human genomic makeup, right? So when you look at advances in precision medicine, when you look at advances in gene editing, so people want a certain kind of color, right, for their children or a certain height. And so this has taken them to manipulating the DNA. Now, you have to look at, look, what are the consequences of that, right? And so what regulation tries to do is study what the consequences are and put safety nets or safety guards in place so that the fundamental uh, makeup of the human genome is not tampered with. So you have to understand this as well so that you can be of value in the regulation process. How do you regulate and minimize the occurrence of fake news, right? Everybody has a voice on social media now, but there's a ton of fake news going around. How do you regulate that? If you've been watching the US Congress of late, um, recently they've been summoning um, a lot of the heads of the social media companies, Google, Facebook, even Apple device manufacturers, right, to see how they can tame occurrences of fake news because we all know how that turned the 2016 election in uh, the US and the emergence of uh, Donald Trump. And, and so regulators are grappling with the fact that, okay, people need to be free to express themselves, but what is the level of responsibility that you must have? Can you pay if you say something about somebody and it's not correct? Uh, what is the level of consequences that you are held accountable to? Because words do have power. And so how responsible should you be? And how responsible should the company that is giving you a platform be in regulating what you say and making sure that they are facts and not alternative facts? So these questions, they pose serious socioeconomic consequences. In Lagos, we are fully aware that regulation must be kept in step with advancing technology sectors. So we are not unaware of the advancing areas in financial technology, in agri-tech, in, um, in the gig economy. And technology entrepreneurs today would find that Lagos State is one of the more improving environments to do business, not only attributing to its large market size and dynamic labor force, but in its a regulatory and civic friendliness to technology development. Now, I don't say this lightly because Lagos State, more than um, other places in the Federation, have experienced the tremendous share of growth in terms of technology. At least uh, between um, 2019 and 2021, um, in, 20, in 2019, about between 600 to 700 a million dollars in venture capital investment came into Lagos. By 2021, it was one point, um, no, in Nigeria, sorry. In Nigeria, 2019, about 600 to 700 million dollars in venture investment came into Nigeria. In 2021, around 1.7 billion, right? So more than 120% increase. 70% of those funds are coming into Lagos startups. Right? Apart from that, over the past six months, about a billion dollars in data center investment has poured into Lagos, right? Because of some of the investments we are making and some of the regulations we are pioneering. And let me talk, take you through some of the things that we are doing in Lagos to be able to enable technology and to drive it, um, uh, to drive value addition in this segment. Um, number one is our investments in Metro Fiber. I'm sure if people have been going around, you've been seeing a lot of digging of late. 
an us spreading a lot of technology infrastructure, um, fiber optic cables and things like that. So I can tell you today we've spread about 2,900 kilometers of fiber optic infrastructure in Lagos, right? We are about to launch the first phase of 3,000 kilometers. And it's not only fiber that we are putting, we're also putting um, duct infrastructure so that a company like MTN or Airtel, they say they want to put fiber optic cables across the city. They don't need to dig the ground anymore. They can just use the existing docks that we've put in the ground. And that saves them a ton of money in terms of the deployment costs. And hopefully they can pass on those savings to customers. Um, past two and a half years. Um, Also in the startup um, uh, ecosystem, today, through the Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council, we funded over 45 startups with grants uh, between um, $9,000 and $12,000, I mean, depending on where the Naira is today. Um, we've supported them in a, a lot of startup funding, and we also fund um, R&D initiatives in the universities. Today, we've done about uh, 50 R&D projects in the universities and we got our first patent in, in 2020. So, as you well know, Lagos State now produces patents, right? And these patents can, um, can be harbingers of wealth where you can build companies around them and, and, and uh, give uh, services, products and services. Um, in terms of legislation, I'm sure some of us are familiar with the Nigerian Startup Bill that just passed through the third reading in the uh, House of Assembly. We were significant contributors to the Startup Bill uh, as well. Um, and what we are currently doing is domesticating that for Lagos. And so that a startup, uh, when they want to incorporate, that process is much faster. When they need access to funding, that process is much faster when they need um, other kinds of permits, uh, when they need other kinds of resources, that process is seamless, right? And we are incorporating all of that into Lagos so, so that startups don't have any issue in terms of access to funding, access to incorporating their business, um, access to all kinds of permits, um, and access to support. Um, we are forming the... Uh, Office of uh, Startup Support, uh, also in Lagos State, uh, that would help uh, the domestication of the startup bill. So that is, that is also going on as well. Um, so um, we are also looking at the technology campus in Yaba. Um, I, I must add that the emergence of Yaba, the Lagos State was also involved. Um, the first fiber optic cable uh, that was deployed in Yaba gave rise to a lot of the startups there. And it was Lagos State that actually gave the right of way um, at the time uh, to main one that delivered the cable and, and saw the mushrooming of a lot of startups in that area. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we also recognize that um, 
a very vibrant technology and startup ecosystem requires safety. And so we are also in the midst of designing the first cybersecurity policies uh, for Lagos that will protect online businesses from all kinds of hacks and all kinds of uh, online compromises. Um, uh, if I had time, I would speak about more, but this is just a snapshot of some of the things we are doing to be able to enable um, uh, technology investment and, and startup activity yeah, in Lagos. Uh, and so it's very important um, that you know that Lagos will continue to drive enabling initiatives and policies that will put the state in a better stead. Uh, it's important that Lagosians, young people like yourselves, um, realize the complexities of civic governance and, and legislation and do their part by participating actively in civic exercises, especially in engaging with your representatives. Wherever you live, whether in Ikeja, whether in VI, whether in Alimosho, you need to engage with your lawmakers, right? That relationship, okay, that relationship helps you to contribute positively to the legislation that is being formulated. And so we, on our part, will work even harder to make sure that we make Lagos the Lagos of your dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think what stood out for me was the need for strategic collaboration. How do you regulate for prosperity if you don't understand what those being regulated require to prosper? So I think it's very important for there to be sustained strategic collaboration between the government and the private um, tech ecosystem players. So thank you very much for your deep insights and the perspectives that you have. I believe that in Nigeria, Lagos State is the pace setter when it comes to public sector innovation. We appreciate the work Lagos State is doing and we hope for better, better regulated tech ecosystem in Lagos State. And if we do it right in Lagos State, it's going to be better for the rest of the states of Nigeria. So thank you very much. Well done. We hope for better things and bigger things from Lagos State. Let's put our hands together once again for the government of Lagos State. So um, I don't know if it would take, I don't know how long you're going to be here, if it would do a group photograph and then... Okay, no, I know we're getting to the next panel session, if you'd be in, and then we'll take the group photograph, so that's fine. Um, so I'm going to welcome Rufai Hosseini to introduce um, our first panel session for the day. He's going to be the moderator for the first panel session. Let's put our hands together for him. So the first panel session is regulations and the fintech space, to regulate or not confronting the dilemma. So Rufai is going to take it from here. Thank you so much uh, for your time once again. Real quickly, we'll go straight to the panel session. Uh, the panelists, we've got uh, Chibuzo Anthony Efobi, Director of Financial Policy and Regulation, okay, at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Just to let you know, there's a stopwatch. Uh, we'll, we'll end less than 40 minutes, maybe 35 minutes. Uh, Hanu Agoje, founder, CEO of Patricia. He's unavoidably absent. Mohammed Ibrahim Jega, co-founder, Dominion Blockchain Solutions Limited. Big round of applause for him. Bukola Olutaya, Managing Director, Stellas Bank. Jeffrey Adam, uh, fin FinTech Professional and Growth Expert. Big round of applause. Bola Jomali, former MD, NASD PLC. And William Phelps, Investment Manager, Adavas. Big round of applause for them as they come on stage. Pleasure to have you all. I understand that our rep from CBN will join virtually. Uh, you have the microphones there on the seat, so I think this is the cool microphone. Okay. Do you have yours? Yes, I have got my okay. If you want to stream, if you want to stream this event, just go to Tech Next on YouTube and Facebook. In case you want to share the links for the okay. live streaming of today's event. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all once again.
I think it's best to start with uh, Mr. Chibuzo, that is virtual, FOB, Director of Financial Policy Regulation, Central Bank of Nigeria, since we're talking about fintech regulation here. Uh, can, can we get a feed that shows him? And can he say something? Do we have him? Okay, while well, we we'll try to battle that, uh, you know, I'd like Mohammed Ibrahim Jaga, co-founder of Dominant Blockchain Solutions, I mean, to give us insights on how regulation has shaped his market in Nigeria. Could you have done more with all the regulation? What are we even regulating? Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, most importantly, uh, we understand technology has a it, as, an, as an enabler has been able to diversify and disrupt different industry on different verticals. Um, for the subject matter of fintech, uh, we've seen how fintech is moving beyond borders, activating and disrupting space. And we feel with regulations, we could be able to do more whereby setting up parameters for businesses and also having all inclusiveness. In my industry, because my background was in the fintech space, I happened to co-found a payment company called Vogue mm. in the early 2010, mm. but now I'm focusing on blockchain. Uh, I'm still an owner of Vogue but um, my focus now since 2017 uh, has been in the blockchain space. Uh, I co-founded a blockchain company providing blockchain as a service. What are we doing in the space is to educate, engage, and let the people understand the different opportunities that blockchain has in the markets. Mm. Because when you hear blockchain, a lot of people think about crypto. There's a lot of might around blockchain. And uh, fortunate enough, we just finished uh, an event last week uh, in Abuja, which one of the biggest blockchain conference hosted by my company. What we did we achieve was to bring in government. We brought in academia and we brought in business. It has never happened before. Bringing three different industry players together to talk about blockchain, to talk about the opportunities in the blockchain space, to showcase what people are building on blockchain. Also, we listen to the government to tell us what do they have in us because government has been doing a lot in the blockchain space but because the businesses have not been able to bring them closer to them, mm. they don't know. And that's why I commend the organizers of this event, the GAT Summit, very critical, because when you bring business and government together, you help enable, because government's an enabler. It helps, it helps regulate. Why CBN did that action about putting a hammer on crypto mm. businesses is because of lack of information, lack of education. If we did the other way side, engage the CBN, yeah. go to them, discuss with them, share information with them, tell them what are the different opportunities in the space. So in the blockchain space, things are moving very well. Mm. And uh, part of my business model, actually, my company is around B2G and B2B. Mm. That is, we are optimizing and increasing efficiency of every government organization and businesses using blockchain. Because one, blockchain is the most trusted, is the most transparent, and is the most secured platform in the world that can use nine terms. Okay. Do we have the feed uh, from the rep of the CBN? Do we have the feed? Huh? He joined and he dropped. Okay, maybe before he joins us again, so that we can also take some of these matters. We we'll, we'll like Bukola Ulutayo. You know, managing director of Stellas Bank to just share with us the challenges you face in this space, regulations and the likes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the challenges with um, regulation is actually boiled, um, is actually based on, just as the rep um, of uh, Lagos State Government actually talked about, based on balancing two things, 
the intention of the regulators to protect the citizens and also to ensure that they support technology. But there's always this um, lag. What I mean by lag is that we found out that there's always this challenge in being able to balance between protecting the citizens and as well ensuring the full strain uh, of technology. So we found a lot of regulators who are very traditional in the way they regulate because they are focused on one thing, which is to protect the citizen. Now, regulation should protect the citizen and as well foster technology because technology will also help the country to actually develop too. Um, technology is actually taking over um, the space. The society is changing. The economy is changing. Economy is now depending on technology. The traditional economy, we can all see that it is actually, you know, not enough to be able to, um, you know, grow the, the country. And what we can now, what can now help the, the economy is technology. So because we, the regulation is not actually full string technology advancement, we found out that there is a little bit of, um, uh, the government is bending towards more protection than not being able to balance. Okay, as Stella Banks, can you say some unique challenges to you that you faced with that? Okay, you know, as, as Stella's bank, we decided to go digital. You know, there's a digital banking, there's new banking. Neo banking is complete online banking. There is no structure. You don't go into the bank at all. And neo banking gained its antecedent of growth during the COVID-19, especially in the Western country. Nobody wants to go out, and then you still want to do your transaction. And the thing is that that industry is what about is what about um, 47 billion dollars, and it's recently just you know, started or gained its antecedent between maybe in the 20s, maybe from 2018, 2019, 2020. But 2020, it grew rapidly. So what we decided to do, okay, let's go digital. The brick and mortar, the traditional banking is not the thing any longer. So we, we want to go digital, we are going digital because, which means all the things that we're going to be doing is not going to be online. Customer service is online. You want, to issue, you want to request for your debit card online. Delivery will be made to your home. You don't need to come. So this system is still alien to the regulators. And when they see some of these things, what we hear is that CBN doesn't issue digital banking. What we issue is normal banking license. So there is still a bit of a clash. And you know, one of the major challenges of traditional regulation is a pacing challenge. Pacing challenge in the sense that technology is running so fast, but regulation is slow. Mm. You know, doing a lot to catch up and is unable to catch up because, tra you know, from experience, regulation takes about five to 20 years to change, and technology changes almost every day. So okay. the, the regulation is finding it difficult to actually change. You know, when you bring up a techno a, an innovation that is a bit alien, you find a little bit of restriction. And so one of the ways that we've been trying to do this is to ensure that there's collaboration. We have meetings, we talk about it. We try to you know, advise the regulator to ensure that regulation is more adaptive now, mm. you know, because it should, it should be more responsive and iterative, okay. and it should be outcome-based. You know, what do we want to achieve? Are we able to achieve it? I think the, the Lagos State Rep was also talking about regulatory sandbox. If some of these things you don't understand, we can create a, a, you know, a test environment, you know, let's look at some parameters, let's test it there, let's see if we are violating any of the laws or any of the policies. So if we violate, then you'll be able to call us back. So those are some of the things that we are 
discussing with the regulators. So the major issue is the fact that there's a lot of innovation coming up and the regulators are you know, finding it slow. slow to catch up with okay. that um, innovation. Thank you so much. Great point. Have we still been able to connect to the CBN rep? Because there are a lot of questions that he needs to answer. Work on it. Okay, we're not still connected. I I'd like... Uh, I'd like Bola Jamali, former MD, NS, NASD PLC, to, to please wade in, you know, on this. And, and, you know, before we come up here, we're talking about some insights and probably things we can learn from Malaysia and the likes. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think she's talking. Uh, okay. And this was, not, this was not a technology issue. <laughs> um, before I to say anything, I would like to say um, a big thank you to Mr. Alaki. I was nodding until my neck hurt with some of the things you were saying, and then I realized that quite a lot of what you were saying, I agreed with a lot of the layout, but the things that Lagos State are doing, I had absolutely no idea that so much was going on. And I somehow think that we should put that information out there a lot more because it's encouraging but not only encouraging, it actually gives people a focus of where to go, which is part of what I was going to say. Um, I, I just completed a tenure of running, starting up, I run in um, a, an OTC market, a stock exchange that runs parallel to the Nigerian Stock Exchange. We have 40 companies, 45 companies trading on the platform. It's worth over a trillion. Um, we never once used the trading floor. We were always technology driven. Challenges were all over the place, but before then, to the conversation we were having, and I'll get back to what we're doing and where we're headed, but I was chatting with a, a young man a few days ago, and he was saying that he is, um, he runs a company that does virtual wallets, and he is in 16 countries. This is a Nigerian, I met him in Lagos, and he's in 16 countries. I said, are you in Nigeria? And he goes, well, he's just about to set up in Nigeria. I said, why? How come you didn't start from here? And he says, nine years ago when he wanted to start, when he wanted to start, it was too difficult. And so he went to another country outside Nigeria, started then, he's now in 16 African countries, and he's now being invited to come and set up in Nigeria. And that says a lot about how easy it is for you to set up a business in this country and something that we need to address from the regulator, from the government, even from the general environment side, we really do need to continue to look at the ease of doing business, the ease of setting up businesses and the sustainability of businesses in this country. If you had made your plans and your budgets uh, in January, I am sure you're looking at a totally different picture right now. Um, if you made your plans as of end of first quarter, you're looking at a totally different picture towards the end of this year. So again, we need to start creating that environment where businesses can, can, can start off, plan, um, put their processes in place, put their agreements in place, and know that a lot of things will run smoothly. And so when you're speaking of um, the infrastructure that's being set up in Lagos State, it's really encouraging and, and um, commendable. So for us, we are... Um, a s well, I say we, uh, but I completed my tenure uh, a, few, a few weeks back. Um, but what we were doing is we were a self-regulatory organization. We were also a regulator of public companies, and we were regulated by the Securities and Exchange Council, so we're uh, Sec Securities and Exchange Commission. So we're in the middle. We were a regulator, but we're also being regulated, and we had a very strong interest in the digital world. Uh, we recently signed an agreement with a Canadian blockchain company that is already running digital exchanges. We did a pilot run last year. At the end of a successful pilot run, uh, we were ready to launch. And so we went to our regulator, the Security Exchange Commission, and we said, we've done this. These are the results. We've engaged in conversation. We want to open a digital exchange. And they said, you can't. There are no rules. I said, okay. And then the rules came out this year, and we find out that there's a certain restriction 
in the rules that's going to delay our starting. In addition is the question of whether um, all things crypto, anything that is in the virtual space is an untouchable according to the CBN or whether some are allowed or not. So there's that conflict already between even our regulators. Some say it's untouchable, some say if it is a security, then it is tradable. And so you need to go into the which are allowed, which are not allowed. Is there an apex regulator somewhere or not? Third problem. Um, again, Mr. Alake spoke about, he mentioned some numbers. I will not say those numbers are wrong, but I would say those numbers probably underestimate the volume of what is going on and the amount of investment that's going on and being turned around. And the reason why it is, it is likely to be inaccurate is because there's so much that's going on that the data is just not available. We're not creating that database where you can see and interrogate what size of activity is going on in this economy. Um, Malaysia, for example, has set up a digital, digital economy corporation. And what that corporation does is it coordinates everything to do with the digital space and make sure that it runs smoothly and make sure that it runs, um, it runs in a manner that encourages innovation and deliberately encourages it and creates the database for it as well. So people can actually look at the data, see the size. Why is data good? It shows how important you are. It shows whether you're struggling. It also even makes it easier for the regulator to say, to, to match regulatory cost to the size of the operation. So if you're a large player, you can match, um, you can decide that above this threshold, it needs to be regulated. Below this threshold, let them grow and see what happens. The last thing I'd say just before I, I stop um, is that, again, there's been a lot of mention about speed of coming up with new rules and new regulations. Absolutely. There's a lot of discussion that needs to go on. Um, there's a lot of weighing and balancing. Would it restrict, constrain? Would it encourage? Would it omit? And this is a very rapid changing environment where, you know, one technology today is obsolete tomorrow. So. There's, it's, a, it's very difficult to create regulations that will capture all that activity and the speed of change. What, some, um, what may be more effective is always coming up with just guidelines, first of all. Just general guidelines. So that those guidelines set some certain parameters within which you can operate. And as time goes on, it can then be codified into regulation rather than starting off with the regulation and then finding out that the regulation is either limited or just doesn't cover the whole spectrum, and then you have to go and go back and start trying to change the regulation. So I'll stop at that point. I, I mean, thank you so much. Uh, great, great insights there you just shared. And we keep seeing a common thread of collaboration, and that's why I would love the rep from the CBN to jump into this. Have we been able to get him? Huh? We, we can't get him. So I'll, I'll come to you, uh, uh, Jeffrey Adam. And I, I just want you to, you know, tie all of this together. The regulators are not running as fast as the businesses. There's a dichotomy there. How can we bridge the gap? Well, I listened to a lot of what has been said and very interesting point. And the Minister of Innovation as well, good point as well. I've been in the industry for over a decade. I've, I've had to sit where people have come to say, Jeffrey, I want to build something and this is what I want to do. And there's always the conflict of, do I have the right ability, capacity, um, right to run that business? That's one side. I work with banks and, and the fintechs as well. But two things I'd like to state to wrap this together. If we look at the statistics, would we put the regulation and the regulators at a positive or at a negative? To be honest, a huge positive. And I'll give you some statistics. Seven years ago, if we look at the number of deployed terminals in the industry to now, huge progress. If you look at the number of startups in the fintech industry, a handful today, over 1,200, is that not a positive? 
If you look at the microeconomics of the states and the fact that a simple but very effective uh, policy was stated around the agency business and how that has evolved and enabled a lot of businesses at the micro level. Is that not a positive? If we look at the innovation that we're finding in transport, in health, in food, in almost all sectors in Nigeria, it is the enablement of people to run online businesses that has made that possible. Now, we have a shuttle business that it's not just the typical uh, four passengers, but you have a whole bus being able to be booked and pick up people. That is being encouraged by certain innovation that has been possible through the regulation. Now, I don't want to go into the statistics of the numbers of transactions that has been enabled and the billions of dollars that is bringing into the economy. So. I would say a huge positive from the regulatory part. Don't worry, don't talk. you can talk about it. The tax guys are not here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but are there negatives? So to be honest, there are. And a few have been mentioned already. Speed. But more importantly, knowledge. People can see all the structures and the policies and the documents, but do they understand it? Can they interpret it? Do they know how that applies to the ideas and the innovations and the things that they would like to do? So what happens is I sit in a business meeting and have all the stakeholders there and they're talking about a certain huge project and it just appears that people know what the regulation is saying but they don't know how to interpret it into what is applicable in business situations and I think this is something that the regulators can improve on. And I hear you say there's a lot of things that Lagos State is doing, but people don't know. Even if they do know, how can they interpret this to become a viable business uh, tool that I can use to innovate and do more things in this, in this space? So what I've taxed myself to do in most times is before I go into any meeting, I try to read up. But not state this regulatory requirement, but interpret it in such a way that my fellow colleagues and stakeholders can take that knowledge away and find ways in which they can, they can use that. And I think if we have a lot of improvement from interpreting those policies, we think that we've blown, uh, we haven't. There's so much opportunities from just understanding these policies and how they can enable businesses. That for me would be where I see a lot of gaps that we can close. So it still goes back to that word around the ecosystem of collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Uh, William Phelps, investment manager at, at Advas, uh, what's your what's your take on this? How can we do this a whole lot better? So I think that talking generally, regulation is a very loaded term, for better or for worse. And I think particularly in the fintech space, or just tech more generally in recent years, regulation has developed quite negative connotations. Because when we look at tech, particularly in this half of, well, after 2010, let's say, it's developed a very disruptive characteristic. It's there to disrupt traditional methods of doing things, to uh, disrupt traditional uh, flows of finance, um, being a notable example. And at the other end of the scale, almost, you have regulation, which is uh, perhaps rightly allied with um, central governments, with central banks, those who I think many in the tech space see as representing that which disruptive technology is seeking to divert away from. But I would argue that this is very much a false dichotomy, and one which you know, has been touched on um, in everyone who's spoken this morning is an unhelpful one. because really, particularly in Nigeria, but I think uh, globally as well, we see many recent innovations in tech regulation being incredibly helpful to the development of a uh, dynamic and uh, collaborative, to use the term again, ecosystem. So if we look at, for example, the uh, startup bill, um, which is you know, something that not only stakeholders, uh, but, but also all participants in the process should be both excited and proud of themselves for, there are huge opportunities presented for the development of a regulated, but at the same time, progressive uh, tech ecosystem in Nigeria. 
So I think what it comes down to fundamentally is marrying previously opposite poles of regulation and innovation to create the sort of ecosystem which, say for example, the startup bill is, is well on the way to doing. Now, for my sins perhaps, when it comes to what I do, I mean, I'm very much involved in the investment side of things and investing particularly in blockchain uh, in Nigeria and in Africa, which perhaps stands as the greatest example of an industry which has been affected by these conversations and these dichotomies. But I think what we're seeing is very much a trajectory that is seeking to bring together, I think, regulators with innovators. So, I mean, as was very well mentioned um, earlier uh, by the special advisor, um, blockchain, for example, offers great opportunities uh, in a variety of sectors, but also at the same time, many risks. And so I think in blockchain and, and more generally, as I've mentioned, it's a question of finding a middle ground as to how not only those risks can be mitigated, but those opportunities fully fleshed out. And I think that's not only the challenge, but also exciting area of potential that Nigeria and more general African and international tech experts, tech innovators have to face in years to come. I mean, one thing we can all agree on is that we need to collaborate. But there's also another part to it where a lot of people see the regulators as punitive. They don't see them fighting for their own interests. I think that's going to be my next layer of question. Do we have the CBN rep? Do we? No, not yet. So how can we collaborate where we have a clash of mindsets? Where an average business, if you ask them, still sees the regulator as punitive. It's how to collect bribes how to feed their own pockets, how to destroy people's businesses. That's how they see the regulator. A clear example is what happened recently in the telecom sector. Yes, we saw the crisis in the telecom sector. So, I mean, I'd like to come to you first on on this. And then maybe we just pass the microphone like we did the last time. How do we balance it out when our mindset... And that's why I really have loved for the CBN rep to be here because two issues crept up. Number one is the case about uh, getting licenses for digital banks. Number two is, you know, the crypto situation. Because, so I am also in tech. And I fell flat. And I'll tell you a quick story. Six years ago, me and some of my partners wanted to set up a payment company. And the CBN 1 billion naira mark scared all of us. And that's how we left. We, we, we had very solid ideas as regards payments. But straight off the back then, They were telling us, oh, you have to put a a paid guarantee of one billion. And this was at 2016. All those ideas out of the room. And nobody can tell us otherwise. We still feel to a large extent they've been punitive. I think you start first. Thank thank you so much. And please, let's ensure to get the CBN rep. Please, please. All right, thank you so much, Ufai. Uh, very, very important. You know, we all agree here on the, on the table that we need to be regulated. But most importantly, we need to understand regulators are not monsters. They are human beings like us. What they need is you need to engage them. We've listened carefully to what Lagos is doing and how they've set up parameters and enable environment for business. But people still think, people still but think me, it's just English. It's not, it's beyond that. Let me give you, let me give, I'm on this side. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in this space for almost two decades. We entrepreneurs are stubborn. And there's a nonchalant attitude of us even to document ourselves. If we take a census of all startups and tech entrepreneurs in Nigeria, most of them are not even registered with CAC. We don't like doing to be documented. We don't like to be documented. And a lot of them are doing business in six and nine digits. 
but they don't want to be documented. So I'm just like cracking up, being the like devil's advocate now, yeah. telling you the other side because I've connected a lot of entrepreneurs in every state in Nigeria. I've listened carefully to them and I've understood that, yes, we want to move, we want to do things, we want government to give, give us this and that, but are we together? Do we have a direction? What have we set up to? Because that regulation will give us an environment, will set up parameters for us. We'll be able to help sanitize us, to understand what it is. Now we're happy with the startup bill. I'm one of the core uh, pushers of the uh, project. Uh, and I'm happy that this is coming in to be able to create that enabling environment for us. NIDA is there. A lot of people don't even know what NIDA is doing. They don't, they fail to make time out of their busy time to go and educate themselves. What are those things government setting up for them? How will they benefit from those incentives? How, what is the low hanging fruit? How can they leverage on all those information to help build up their businesses? Yes, we understand sometimes governments are too aggressive in terms of their approach, but I'm telling you this, if we engage them as a force, did you hear me, sir? If we engage them as a force to share with them what we are doing, how we want it to be done, and what we want from them, they'll be happy to work together with us. I, I think he doesn't agree with you. He, 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 he wants to differ because maybe he's been hit. By... Okay, um, I'd like to say this. Um, there is a little bit of um, issue with the way things are being handled. And what I mean is that regulators can mean well for you know, players. But how do you let the players know the reasons why you are doing some things? He talked about an idea now and they ask him to drop a particular guarantee. Do they understand or do they know the reasons why they are asking them to do that? So there is this, as you said, there, there should be this collaboration. Now, regulators, players, they are not enemy. We are so, regulators are supposed to be able to, or maybe the staff or the people who are representing the reg, um, regulators should be able to explain to the players why some of these things are being done. You don't just, you know, mention some things like as if it's a fiat or a, a command. You understand? We are in this thing together and the goal of everybody is to ensure that this country gets better. By what you are doing, by what the regulators are doing, we are all contributing to the country. Yeah. So we are not supposed to see ourselves as enemy. Are they explaining the reasons behind these actions? And sometimes when policies are being made, and the players carried along. So, you know, he talked about knowledge. The truth is that if you don't understand how that industry is being played, some of the policies that you're going to be dishing out is not going to be consistent with the way the things are being done there. And one major thing the regulators need to adapt now is to move away from the traditional regulation to, they need to adopt technology, There's something called reg tech, regulatory technology. Let them also begin to use technology. This will also increase the pace at which they also regulate. They will be able to understand, we will be able to understand. In fact, some of those things will be automated. We don't need to, I don't need to be at your office. You know, I, I should just be able to go to the platform that you've created for all those things and we're able to do it. You should be able to regulate from your office via technology. You understand? Some of these things, if I understand that you understand me, understand my business, you are also into technology, I will feel it more comfortable. You understand? But when you are regulating me and you don't understand what I'm doing, I will feel like what you are doing, you understand, is like you're just guessing or you're just trying to do something. You know, my assumption would be that you just want to, you just want to, you know, scare me off because you don't understand what I'm doing. You just want to pull me off. You know, I said I want to do this because you don't understand. You just want to ask me to get out, get off my face. And that's the way sometimes some of these policies are being interpreted. So the players, they need to educate, they need to also explain to the players they also need to also adopt a lot of technology in the approach at which they regulate. That's some of the things. Th thank you so much for that, Mr. Mr. Bola Jamali, I'm sure you like to sound off on this. 
And have we gotten the CBN rep yet? So at least he gets okay, a stab on this before we end. So, so I'll start off by saying regulators are not, um, they're not punitive. I think, do we have CBN? No? Do we have CBN? Okay, it's connected. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, regulators are not punitive. They're not there to um, tax the system. They're just a product of, I mean, if that happens, that's a product of the country as a whole. I mean, try going into police station to report a case and you'll see how, you know, what oh, kind yes. of results you get. So, so really, the regulators are there to establish a certain kind of control. However, their DNA says you do it like this and you stick with this. Where we are is that everyone, I mean, if I set up a business in my garage, what I'm looking to do is solve one, a new problem, two, do things differently, and three, um, get as much coverage as possible, as quickly as possible, and as cheaply as possible as well, and scale up from there. That's what my aim is as an entrepreneur. The regulator says you must register, first of all, and from there, you must comply with certain rules, requirements, governance standards, and so on, mm. right? A startup normally has a bit of a problem in doing that. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, a lot of tech firms, a lot of um, the tech industry as, as a whole, naturally would be very, divide, very, what's the word now, um, fractious. The tiny groups, tiny individuals all over the place, Right now, as we speak, I think there are about three or four other conferences going on in the country addressing technology. If you came together as one lobby group, as one group, the force behind it, again, that's why it's important for there to be data, for there to be information. If everyone comes together and say, we are the tech industry, whether we have a regulator or not, we are the tech industry, and we need to have these things in place. I'm sure somebody will listen and it'll be a far more powerful voice than just the six of us up here um, saying it's necessary. I think we should create a movement where the whole tech industry comes together and establishes itself as a force, just like you have the Manufacturers Association uh, mm -hmm. of Nigeria of the past, um, the Bankers Associations, and so on. The tech industry needs to come together, form an association that is a strong lobby, lobby group and shows its importance to the country. I mean, so it's, it's, it's time long overdue for, for sort of like a tech union of some sort, right? Jeffrey? Yes, I, I like that, the tech union. That would be interesting. Mm. Uh, but I think to add to, uh, to his point as well, most times, because we are the business end of this whole economy, we often are explorers. We go out and find what's the new idea, what are the things going on in other parts of the world, probably faster than the regulators. But the gap is that we find all this knowledge, we don't come together to consolidate it and then approach the regulators to work with them to see how we can prepare the Nigerian market for the global economy, sorry, opportunities that we have identified. Some people do that, but I often see that they do that to promote the business that they want to do, not promote it in the sense of trying to structure Nigeria for that opportunity. So I think to improve our collaboration with the government and the regulators, when ideas are becoming apparent, the opportunities are becoming apparent, this tech union, like this initiative that you've spoken about, can come together, discuss it, uh, document it, and find a way to interact with the regulators to put better structure for that opportunity to thrive in Nigeria. Uh, my second point on, on, on this as well would be, if we look around the room and we ask 90% of people, if you have any questions around any of the policies, who would you email or call at the regulatory office? How many people here do you think would know? Show of hands, who would you email? And let's just do a, a quick poll. If you know who to email at the CBN office or any government office for policies about CBN, please raise, raise your, your hand. hand. Wow, and the DG of NITA is just in front of you. <laughs> so this is the point I'm trying to make. 
We have hubs of information, hubs of professionals, hubs of everything, but not a lot of collaboration and integration. This is the players in the industry, and no one, not one hand was raised. So I wish the, the CBN people were connected. One of the things I would like to ask is, put a customer service department in place mm. so that people can call in to find out things. People can call in to get more information. People can call in to give ideas. People can call in to give uh, updates on future tech and future opportunities that you can bring people together to create a framework for. This is the gap that can really exponentially improve our economy in tech. I mean, it make, makes a lot of sense, and that's why we need that tech union. Probably we'll like to draw need that too to be members of that tech union and draw every other regulatory body in tech. Uh, we'll, we'll quickly come to you, uh, Mr. Felp, just, just to share your insights on this. Then we go to the CBN. I hear we're connected. A lot of people are sending us questions already. A lot of people have questions for the Lagos State Government. You're thrilled. Please keep sending your questions. I'll get all of them here. Yeah, real quickly. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with the general sentiment that actually regulation and legislation is a two-way street. Uh, and the idea, I think, of the tech industry grouping together and working with and approaching the regulators is a very important one because I think the last thing that anyone in the tech industry wants is to be a passive body and receive red lines and, uh, and sort of ob objective um, rulings uh, at almost the whim of, of whatever body it might be, whether it's the CBN or the SEC, etc. So I, I think not only should the tech industry look to regulators to, well, I suppose lead, being the fact they are regulators, but they must also take a proactive approach and I think be engaged in the process and commit themselves as stakeholders. And I also think, again, talking from an investment perspective, that actually investors, both domestically and internationally, in Nigeria need to take a similar approach. Because one of the questions I often ask myself is, you know, Nigeria is leading the way as far as venture capital investment goes in Africa, and, and rightly so. But I think we can all agree that it can be doing a great deal more. And why is that not happening? And I think one of the reasons is because there hasn't necessarily been this engagement between uh, members of the investment community and regulators such that there are these gaps of knowledge. And with that, I think, uh, a lack of clarity as to not only what uh, investors can seek to gain um, from uh, projects in Nigeria, but also what they owe uh, to projects uh, in Nigeria as well. Because investment, much like innovation, and indeed regulation, is a two-way street. And I think all of these areas overlap, and it's important to remember that overlap. And I think with, again, the key word collaboration can only come uh, development, and that's the point towards which we should be heading. Right, thank you so much. So we finally have the CBN rep connected. Do we have him? Good. So if you can hear us, uh, pleasure to have you. Uh, a lot of people think a lot of things about the CBN. They're talking about the CBN on understanding some of the deployments in tech, crypto. Uh, they want clarity on that. They also want clarity on digital banking licensing. They also say the regulators are punitive in general. So if you can answer all of these areas, let's talk about it. Can you hear us? Okay. Shall I repeat it? Did he hear me? so he can respond to it. Yeah, so, and please, you, you can also send in your questions. I understand we have some questions. Uh, David, I'll be waiting for those questions, if you can send some of them to me. Here we have a lot of questions for the Lagos State Government, and the Lagos State Government will probably they'll be part of this, our tech union. You know, when they sit in, because we must have something. We must have sort of like a consultative forum where we meet maybe a quarter every year and we're constantly talking. You know, it's because we don't talk, that's why it looks as though we're doing things in silos. Maybe once every quarter or twice a year where we all meet. And the good thing is that we're in tech. We don't have to collect ESTA code. We can sit virtually 
and communicate and talk and have these conferences. It's post-COVID. And we just have to keep talking because we need to make it work. Because if we don't crack it, we'll be denying ourselves of the numerous opportunities. I feel sad that people think oil could be the mainstay when there's tech there. When we get our acts together, tech will over, overtake oil in no time. And it will do it conveniently because tech can scale or it can scale. You can do multiple numbers over nine, but Nigeria, since the 1960s, have not been able to go beyond 2.53 million barrels per day. Yes, you can't do it. You can't do it. Because for you to get one well working, you have to invest billions in the sector. But in tech, you can go va 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 voom and iterate and do it quickly. Yes, we're waiting for the CBN rep, please. Okay, please, we'll, we'll, we'll like the DG just to come up while we try to set up the CBN rep. If we get some questions, please just come up, sir. Uh, the DG of NITDA, if you can just quickly give a quick insight in his keynote. Yeah, because of time. Okay, we will take your keynote because of time. Okay, or maybe you just confer with me. If it's a quick insight we can give or something. Okay. Okay, please just give us your insight, then we'll take your keynote afterwards. Okay. Why does Lagos State want to kill existing business? Okay, will there be avenue for investors in this summit? I know you guys do a lot of investment in blockchain. Uh, if you can just talk to them about uh, investments and how they can reach you, if they have ideas in blockchain. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess talking in general, blockchain, very exciting, not only um, for the sector as a whole, but also for Nigeria in particular. Um, I mean, I, I've been based in, in Lagos for about a month now. I'll be out here for another few months, and I've seen more energy um, in Nigeria than, uh, well, anywhere else in Africa or indeed, I think, Europe when it comes to blockchain. Um, and as investors, uh, the company I'm, I work at, Adiverse, are always looking to facilitate and foster that energy and that growth. Um, so you can contact me uh, very easily, William at Adiverse, uh, A-D-A-V-E-R-S-E dot C-O. Uh, or look, at us, look us up online at um, .co and uh, yeah, send over any applications or, um, or project ideas you have and uh, okay. we can grow from there. Thank you so much. So if you need investment in blockchain, Adverse is there. We'd like to call on the DJ of NITDA uh, to come up for his keynote. So sorry, we understand you're pressed for time. Uh, Please, a big round of applause, and you can do the official introduction once again. Thank you so much. Big round of applause. So we don't welcome, sir. Yeah. So we'll take the combined. What's happening? 
Sorry, we'll take the combined Q&A for this panel after okay. his keynote address. So just okay. keep your questions. We're going to take that, and Rufai is going to coordinate that. Okay. So quickly, let's do a quick group photo, this panel session. Yes, with, with the DG for keynote. Please. For Thank you for having me. First and foremost, I want to thank the organizers of this summit for creating this platform to activate this difficult conversation. I think it is overdue to have this kind of conversation. And from what I deduced from the previous speakers and the panelists, reminded me about a story I read of an encounter between the former British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, and Michael Faraday, the inventor of electricity. Faraday was trying to explain to Gladstone the, his innovation about electricity. And Glaston just keeping asking him, what is it for? What is it for? At the end, Faraday said, one day you will be able to tax it. So you can see the gap between innovators and those in government. It is a huge gap. That's years ago. Not now. But having people like Alake in government can create a buffer for us to help translate the tech innovation to the people in government so that the policy makers can understand you, the change makers. But also, it is very important to understand the future of technology itself the government, and then we talk about regulation. I think about it a little bit this way, about the future of technology. You all know about Alice in the Wonderland story. You know it, you remember Alice saw the white rabbit with clock rushing, saying that late, late on a very important day. And Alice rushed after the white rabbit into it is rabbit hole. Two decades ago, we were all Alice. And we encountered this technology and we rushed after it to the wonderland. Then what happened in the Wonderland? In the Wonderland, we learned we can search Google. But two decades now, we realize that we search Google, but not as much as Google searches us. Two decades ago, we assumed we use social media. But today, we realized social media uses us more than we use social media. 
two decades ago, we thought these are free services. But now we realize that these big techs see us as a great human beings, free raw materials for extraction, production, commodification, and sales. They see us as a free raw material. Our most dangerous illusion in the Wonderland was we see these platforms as an unprecedented tool to improve democracy and increase freedom. But now we realize that these unprecedented platforms are eroding democracy and diminishing freedom. Eight years ago, I was in the other side of the table, like you. I was brought up to believe that to succeed in business or in the world we are is to start and grow my tech business and take it to a global market. That time, I always look at how can I hack the law or stretch the law to get my product into the market. We built a cross-border remittance platform successfully and we tested it. It worked successfully. Within a month, we were able to settle over 100 million naira from the United Kingdom to Nigeria. And it works instantly using Bitcoin and other API technology. At that time, we had over 110 Bitcoin. But because of the challenges and the lack of the communications with the government, we failed. and we have to wind down the startup. Today, I'm in the other side of the government, but that's broadened my mind to start thinking, what is government? I believe all of you, if I say government, we mean democratic government. And this also, reminded me about a story I read. In 1787, as the American Constitutional Convention reached its conclusion, Benjamin Franklin was asked as he departed the Independence Hall, what type of governments the delegates had created. He famously replied, a republic if you can keep it. That response resonated across the world and through ages. We have political parties with republic. We have nations named with republic like Federal Republic of Nigeria. So what does a republic mean? Republicanism is not about the Republic Party in the United States because he made that statement almost 70 years bef before Republican Party was formed. A republicanism is a political ideology that trace it is root to the Roman times. The ideology opposes a social structure that allows groups to hold and exercise unaccountable power 
domination over others. So most of our democracy is behind, is around this ideology. That's why it also not limited to kings, emperors, military dictators, but tech executives. Because today, the tech executives are more powerful than the political leaders. If you could remember, just before the last US election, President Biden was asking Facebook, would you mind just minimizing the disinformation in your platform? And Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the America, organized a summit with people like you leveraging on these big tech platforms to create services. And she was lobbying them to talk to the big tech so that they can stop doing what makes them more profitable. So you can see how powerful these big tech are. The government, the government is begging them. Begging them. So, so, is it the so type of the democracy type we, want? we want? And this and is this totally is against the republicanism ideology. ideology. So, 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 that's why, that's why also, also, if you also look at the, the history of the regulation, regulating the big tech itself, when it started, we say, it's a free space. Like in 1996, John Barlow declared that, declared the independence of cyberspace in Davos, where he predicted a new home, a cyber world without governments. And in 2013, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO and chairman of Google, also said cyberspace is an ungoverned space. But five years later, Mark Zuckerberg, when, when testifying before the Congress, he said, I'm not saying there should be no regulation. The real question, as the technology becomes important to people's life, is what is the right regulation? Not whether there should be or not. So I think we are all on the same page with Mark Zuckerberg. From what I hear from the panelists, we all agree there should be a regulation. But what is the right regulation? And how can we get a right regulation? For me, getting a right regulation is beyond government sting in the offices and creating arm theory regulation. The government needs to work with you in the ecosystem to co-create the regulation. Because we know the regulation we are going to create is not a regulation we can get from textbooks of legal or political theories. Because the generation before us have never had to deal with this kind of situation we are dealing with. So we are not going to get anything from them. It's something we need to work together and create it. And the only way we can achieve that is when we converse. Now we have started the conversation. 
how can we get a right regulation? So it's not about you, the players in the tech innovation ecosystem, to sit in your comfort zone and start blaming the government. That government is not doing the right things. Because the government doesn't even understand what you are doing. You need to come and explain to the government to understand what you are doing before the government can help you create the right regulation. So what are we doing as a government to achieve that? I think ne never before in the history of this country we had a government with a political will to help the tech innovation ecosystem like this government. It started by resignating and expanding the mandate of our ministry to cover digital economy. That means the government understands the technology is beyond just technology. It can improve a lot. And this is not only the government. All of us, before we understand the technology wrongly, we look at it from the eyes of consumers. Where can we buy it? How much does it cost? Or from the eyes of capitalists, how can I exploit it? How can I build businesses around it? So we need to look at it from the eyes of citizens. What does it mean for better society? Or how does it change the way we live? Because this is the only way we can address this challenge. Because technology is beyond whatever we think. It is no more business or commercial. It is political. Because the technology we have today can limit you from what you do. That means it has power. Those that control it exact power over us. The right codes, rules that we must obey to use that technology. And the people in government also, they are using that technology for their day-to-day -day activities. That means the technology can be used for recruitment. We have seen it in the case of Amazon, where technology is Digit, uh, is gender bias. So if you look at this, this is beyond technology or business. It is a political question that can address who can get job under what condition. And also, the technology can profile you about your credit worthiness and a lot. That means the people designing the code or the technology, they are beyond just software engineers. They need to see themselves as a social engineers because that technology is used to deliver justice on us. It's only our laws or our legislation that is allowed to create rules and regulations in a society or decide who gets what under what conditions. But today, technology is doing that. So we need to look at it as beyond just a technology or as a commerce. So we should stop using commerce principles to it and apply political principles to it. That's what will help us to achieve a right regulation. So the government's role basically is to create an enabling environment through interventions in terms of laws, policies, and other things so that we can have a safer digital space for all and enabling environment for you to thrive as an entrepreneur. 
So the government, we discussed about the startup bill which has been passed at the National Assembly. That will help us solve a lot of challenges discussed at the panel session. Like we talked about the tech union. Under the startup bill, there is a National Council for Technology and Innovation which is going to be chaired by Mr. President and all regulators, they are going to be members and the tech ecosystem will be represented there. And also there is provision for labeling. We, we hear about that. We don't want to register, we don't want to do this and that. But that also is important for our business as well. We all want to access funding, and the people that will invest need to do their own due diligence. And sometimes, some of us want grants from the government. So the government also needs to know you to give you that grant. And sometimes, you need government's intervention when there is a problem of uh, police harassing you or other things. For government to intervene, also the government needs to know you. So that law provides that labeling, there is a provision for incentivization and so many other things. And also, just early this year, the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy laid a delegation to here in Lagos. We met the tech ecosystem in this hall where we discuss most of the pain points and how can government help you to thrive. And most of the pain points raised at that conversation was taken to the Federal Executive Council and the Federal Executive Council has approved to do, achieve three things. Firstly, we work with the FRSC to see how we can get more incentives for you. Secondly, to work with BPP, to come up with a bimodal procurement process so that government can patronize you. And thirdly, how can we protect your IP and uh, patents? So the government is working on all this and the startup bill is going to consolidate that. So I believe with this kind of conversation, Nothing will stop Nigeria from becoming a force to reckon when we talk about innovation in the world. And the government is a listening government, is ready to work with you. That's why we always come to you when you invite us. And we want you to reciprocate. A few weeks ago, we issued a code of practice but many people in the ecosystem didn't read it, didn't contribute to it. We said we want to co-create. We don't want to create from our own offices. That's why we issue it for public comments and inputs. So we still want you to go and look at it to see how you can uh, how you can add your own contribution to make it a better law for us or regulation because we are using it as a stopgap. We are going to have a law on that very soon and we are going to work with you to achieve that. My belief is there are things you can do as an ecosystem and government cannot do and there are things government can do you cannot do, but together we can do greater things and make you proud. Thank you.
education to specific regulation to policies, NIDA is very, very central. And we hope that as we've created this vehicle for sustained engagement, that we would have more opportunities to interact in a very, very constructive manner with NIDA so that we can facilitate the development and the progress of the tech ecosystem in Nigeria. I'd like to invite again Rufai Oseni to quickly wrap up the first panel session, I think the Q&A, ask a couple of questions, and we just move forward to the next keynote address. Thank you so much, sir, and have a safe flight back to Abuja. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just to quickly wrap up the Q&A, we, we got a couple of questions. The questions were around the Lagos State Government, uh, the words, not mine, of the people that ask the question, why is the government trying to kill business? Why are they stifling us? Huh? No, 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 good. So, and um, uh, for those that wanted investment in blockchain, uh, Adverse uh, is there, and he's also giving you the details. So, real quickly, can you just answer the question? I think that's about the only question we've got on the panel session. And thank you so much once again to all the panelists. Really appreciate each and every one of you for your time. And, and, and I'm sure you had, you know, rich conversation. It's a shame we couldn't get uh, somebody from CBN to uh, join us just to get more clarity on the issue. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get a mic across to you. So you just, uh, no, you can just answer over there. Sorry. Yeah. And as the guys are leaving. All right. Um, thank you for the question. I guess I was looking for a more technology-specific question. But um, anyways, so... Um, why is Lagos killing business? I think that's a very inconsistent statement um, from my own measurement because Lagos State actually depends on businesses to thrive because about 80% of the economy of Lagos is the private sector and that is the significant portion of the tax base comes from the private sector. So Lagos State government wouldn't even exist in a sense, in a large part, without the private sector. So it's a very incongruent um, a statement. I'm not quite sure um, perhaps what the person is alluding to and perhaps maybe there's a specific industry that they are talking about. Maybe it's transportation, maybe it's tech, but I can tell you for a certainty that Lagos State is not trying to kill tech at all. And in fact, is from what I mentioned earlier, is trying to enable the industry better. But I, I also want to speak on a, a little bit on, on regulation and why I think some of the suggestions that were made on the panel session that all of us here have to take it into cognizance and really drive the conversation, number one, by forming a, a very powerful speaking group or a very powerful lobbying group to regulators where the entire tech industry comes together. The banking industry, I think, uh, have been very adept at this. You know? And I, I wanted to give an example of why you should even want regulation. I think it was in the early 2000s, um, when the central bank uh, decided to make regulations on the banking industry. And they said that, look, if you want to become a bank, minimum capital requirements must be 25 billion, right? And a lot of banks complained at that time that, look, man, this is too heavy. How can we get 25 billion as a minimum capital requirement, right? What is our minimum cash reserve ratio? Meaning that the amount of deposits you should keep on reserve as opposed to those that you loan out. All of these factors point to stabilizing the banking system. And so when the CBN, I think it was um, Professor Charles Soludo, who is the, the current governor of Anambra, who was the CBN governor at that time. When they put this regulations into uh, space. A lot of banks complain, this is too much, this is crazy, it's predatory, it is, uh, as uh, Rufai said, it's punitive. Um, there were about around between 89 to 95 banks in Nigeria, but the minimum capital requirements reduced the number of banks to about 25 because a lot of them had to merge with each other. 
they had to do a lot of mergers and acquisitions. But what happened later was that the banks, having a much larger uh, capital reserve requirement, made them more stable, right? Made them more strong. Because if, I, I, I don't know if a lot of young people here, if you were doing banking in the 80s and in the 90s in Nigeria, it was a very tumultuous period. You could put your money into a bank and within a year, that bank could be gone. Kaput. There were no rules. Banks were just doing what they liked. In fact, there was a huge, there was a time, I think in the early 90s, during our bachelor's time, banks were failing right, left, and center. But over the past years, how many banks have you seen that have failed? They are much more stable. They are internationally recognized. In fact, after those rules, the Nigerian banks started showing up on international rankings, right? Because there were rules that were guiding them, even though it was seen as predatory at the time, you know, it be they became more stable. Your cards could now be accepted abroad, you know, and things like that. And so the, the industry, today, as I'm telling you, 95% of banking assets in Nigeria are owned by Nigerian banks. And that's just to tell you the stability, right, that is within the Nigerian banking sector and all the rules that made that happen. You understand? And so that is why it's important that the tech industry as well form that lobbying group to be able to help CBN, all the other regulatory agencies make the right legislation. Let me bring an example close to home. In Lagos, for instance, there is a body called the Lagos State um, Signage Agency, right? LASA. LASA regulates all kinds of signs in Lagos. If you lived in Lagos in the 90s or perhaps in the early 2000s, anybody could come to the front of your house and post a poster. You know, it could be, it could be a poster of this size. It could be, you know. And the thing about it is that those posters were huge, huge, um, you know, they were disturbances because at the end of the day, you yourself, you have to re rip out the poster. You have to repaint your wall. But there are fines for those things now. Because it used to cost customers a lot of headache. People used to put all kinds of signs, all kinds of billboards, no matter what, could obstruct your driving um, visibility and all of that. But when LASA came in, they came in with standard rules on the kind of billboards you need to do, on the kind of posters you need to do. You understand? And through some of their levies, Lassa was the one that started putting street names, right? Because in Lagos in the 90s, if you were going from here to Alimosho, you are on your own. But at least now, you can see each street has a name. You understand? That was Lassa's work. So a, a lot of um, the things that need to happen to stabilize industries require legislation. The issue is that, are you in that conversation? And that's why I said that you need to know your representative so that you can contribute to smart city legislation that will help drive whatever industry you are, you are whether it's agri-tech, whether it's fintech. So Lagos State is not, Lagos State needs businesses to survive. It's not, it's, ve it's a very incongruent summary judgment to say it is killing businesses. That's not the case. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much. I understand that some people actually wanted us to um, get them to integrate if they had questions and then put the questions down or ask them verbally. Um, maybe I would give room for just one question. There's a specific question on Echo Innovative Center. Maybe you want to take that and then I'll just we'll wrap up with that. Sorry. Okay. Hello. Yeah. So just make it pretty quick. And let's... Thank you very much. My name is Patrick Oseg. I mean, my question goes directly to you, Mr. Tuboso. Okay, so I want to ask, you are the chair in the Co-Innovation Center. 
And recently, or previously, I've been trying to get across to Ecote Innovation Center for partnership and funding. I will sent you a message on your IG, I DM'd you, no response. So it's difficult for we techpreneurs that have ideas that is going to be beneficial to Lagos State, but the channels or the agencies that are being set by the Lagos State is not, nobody, we're not getting response. Even when you chat with them, you'll be chatting with the bug, bot chat, basically. So how do we get this personal okay. encounter with you? Okay, Who so is in charge directly we need to talk to? Okay. Um, so I'm not the chair of Eco Innovation. Eco Innovation is a, is a private sector um, innovation hub. Um, the thing is we, we have a lot of partnerships with Eco Innovation because they are... Uh, their portfolio is mainly based on civic technologies. So technologies that affect the civic environment, whether in transportation, uh, healthcare, cybersecurity, things like that, right? So um, Eco Innovation is a private sector um, body. You know, they are just partners with us, so that, that's on the one hand. On the second hand, in terms of how can innovators re reach us, so, have, has anybody heard of LASRIC before? The Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council. So, basically, it's a body um, that is responsible for helping drive innovation and science research in Lagos State. And so, what the body does is that it manages a part, a very small part of the um, Lagos State budget to funnel funding into startups, into R&D, into STEM projects in schools. And so usually what, how Lazaric does that is that periodically, um, say maybe every quarter, they have call-outs, right? So um, innovation call-outs where they open up and they say, look, for startups that have certain ideas in certain industries, agri-tech, fintech, whatever, you know, bring your applications, right? And so that's how the engagement is run. So we, we reach out to the ecosystem um, uh, to say that, look, if there are innovators working on certain kinds of solutions, right, they can apply and the portal allows you to apply to submit your application and then a panel goes through the application. If you are successful in the application, you are contacted to come for a further interview. And in, most, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of people have been funded. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a number of innovators that we funded and R&D projects as well. So that, that is usually how we communicate. We communicate in a very structured manner. Um, for people that may not need funding, right, and say, look, they have um, an idea or a company or a solution that is prime time, is ready, the, the issue we face is that a lot of people contact us, but their solutions are not quite ready for prime time. And, and what I mean is that it might not be speaking to all the issues at hand. But there is a website that a sister agency runs called the Solutions Hub. I, I don't know if it's up at the moment, the Lagos Solutions Hub, where innovators can put their solutions, right, and say, look, this is... Um, the issue that we can solve, uh, whether it's for Lagos State, within the civic environment. And then there are people at the back end that would, you know, go through the adjudication process with you. You understand? So that's one area. But for my portfolio, we deal a lot with startup funding, R&D funding, and you can reach um, us through the portal, lazaric.lagosstate.gov.ng. But usually, we communicate during call-outs, right, uh, to try and get uh, investors funded uh, and, and things like that. So if you go to lazaric.lagosstates.gov.ng, you can learn more about some of the uh, programs that we do. Thank you so, so much. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we'll be moving to our second panel session. Um, but before that, just a couple of um, quick formalities. 
Um, we have two restrooms just down the stretch to your right for ladies and gents in case you're pressed and you need to use the convenience. It's just down to your right. We have an emergency exit. with Nigeria Info FM Lagos is the moderator for the next panel session. Is he here? Oh, let's put our hands together for him as he comes forward. So the next panel is on regulating for the future, providing solutions for smart governance. So it promises to be very, very interesting. So um, Mr. Mano, it's over to you. Thank you very much. It's good to have you. Hello, good morning. Or it's afternoon already. Good afternoon. Uh, we've had very, very serious conversations earlier. I'm here to lighten things up. I don't like when things are very serious. Though we pass the message, and I hope the Nitsda Lagos State Government already have the message. But we'll keep saying these things. Um, I'm going to read a quote here from, um, from John Powell, um, David said this quote earlier, but I'm going to emphasize it now. He said, honest, open communication is the only street that leads us into the real world. Emphasis on honest, emphasis on open communication. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about in this Nail Spasner session. I want everybody on in the panel session to be honest, to be open, and I'm just going to be the middleman. I would like questions, a lot of questions from the audience to the panelists, and we'll leave those trail of thoughts for the Lagos State Government and also the federal government, NITSDA, you know, NCC, to see these things and actually work on them. So without further ado, I will call on um, members of the panelists. Um, okay, NITSDA was just stepped out. So we have um, Yomi at DDG, co-founder of Softcom. Is he in the house? Yomi at DDG, are you here? Oh, you're representing. Okay. Okay, please, a round of applause, please. <laughs> Tammy Larry Olajide, please, just have a seat. Thank you. Please, a round of applause, Swaha. Also, we have here Olu Wemimo Osanipin. Sorry, I'm very bad with your names, please. Forgive me. Olu Wemimo Osanipin, thank you very much. And also, we have Professor Ajayi Ayodili Ebenezer. Do we have him here? Thank you, sir. Please, a round of applause for him. Also, we have the co-founder and CEO at Penny, Miriel Emanuela. Is she here? Please, a round of applause for her. Please join us here, podium. And then we have the chief of staff at UVerify, Simi Opayemi. 
Hi. Please a round of applause for her as they join us on stage. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into the panel session. Uh, the topic is already in place. What we're going to do is just have open and honest conversations. Um, they're going to be sharing with us their challenges, you know, in tech, in the adoption of tech here in Nigeria, in Africa, and then we're going to talk about regulation. How has it affected your business um, so far in Nigeria? Um, let me start with the ladies, please, gentlemen. Let me start with the ladies. So, tell us, Simi. Okay. So, tell us, how has the adoption of tech been for your company? And then you tell us about regulation. You've heard what Nidad Boss said. You've heard what the Lagos State Government is saying about technology and about the regulation. Can you just tell us what are your thoughts on this? Thank you for that. So I'm going to start with a positive note and then I'll talk about some areas for improvement. So by profession, I'm actually a lawyer and in a lot of, that I've, a lot of work I've done, I've had to deal with the Corporate Affairs Commission. So I'm going to use them as an example as to how things can be better in a practical sense. So sometime before the pandemic, um, all the CAC processes were very analogous. Pretty much you had to turn in a piece of paper, wait for the paper to get to somebody's desk, have it processed. If they were going to queries, they were going to send you a query by paper and that was going to work through all the processes, different people's desks. Now, during the pandemic, they said they didn't want to see anybody, obviously, for safety reasons. So a lot of documents that needed to be filed, which all, always have statutory deadlines, stayed on people's desks and people were not getting responses. CAC wasn't allowing people into their offices. And there was lots of pandemic, I want to say use the word pandemic in the CAC office. So you'd go there and then nobody would respond to you. Sometimes you'd have to use somebody on the side to get into the office only to get no response. So pretty much things were at a stalemate and companies had to move forward because nobody in the tech space or in business world would understand that your excuses, nobody was okay. attending sorry, to you. Sorry, Simi. I actually missed out on some day, someone that is also supposed to be on the panel session. Uh, we have the CEO of CWG. Uh, are you here, sir? Please join us up on the podium. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry about that mix-up. Please join up on stage. Okay, you can go on, Sydney. Sorry. Okay, I'll just wait for the uh, Why he joins to join us, us, you can just stage. go on. <laughs> okay. Mr. Adewale Adeyipo, thank you very much for joining us. All right, Simi. Okay, so where was I? <laughs> Pretty much. Things were not moving forward, but the law requires you to file things like your annual returns and to um, put in your change of directors or whatever it is by a statutory period. So what happened? Sometime last year, CAC decided to digitize the entire process. So no more waiting for someone's, someone in CAC to pass your document from this desk to the next, next desk. And the testimonies are abundant. For instance, now, it takes somewhere between two to four days for you to register a company end-to-end. -end. I was shocked when I tried it this year, and it actually worked because you know the Nigerian factor where they tell you one thing and then you go there, and you're, in reality, it's obviously a sham. But that's an example of how recognizing that old archaic methods don't work, and it all came into place because CAC, or rather the Corporate Affairs Commission and the legislation, because at some point in time, there was Kama 2020, which is the, uh, the law that governs Corporate Affairs Commission, realized that we don't have the human capacity and there's so much more to expand into if we, re if we put it into a digital method. So no more do you have to take a piece of paper. And also from a, from a data privacy and security perspective, 
it's so much better when you do things digitally. For instance, if you go to CAC, you see a bunch of files everywhere. And there isn't, there isn't the number of human beings in the world to man every single piece of paper out there. So you pretty much are leaving it up to anybody who can have access to the CAC to pick up a piece of document. And those, those documents usually have personal information that needs to be protected from just anybody's access. So that's a, that's a blessing and a testimony from the digitization perspective. Now, this is just one example of how things can work. There are so many other ways, but we haven't gotten there. And we haven't gotten there because we, have, we don't even recognize the, the boundaries that can be charted if we decide, let's, let's take a practical approach. Let's put it in a digital method. So now, let's think of other ways. Our company, you verify, we assist with due diligence for mostly banks and other businesses whereby we verify individuals and addresses to ensure that you are who you say you are or you reside where you say you are or you're affiliated with that address. Now, we know there's a lot of trust issues with people representing themselves everywhere. So we take that responsibility for you as a bank, for instance, because I imagine that there are so many people that are trying to onboard into one specific bank, for instance. And we do that, all of that, and we put it in a very easy to use medium. We haven't gotten to the point where we've reached the whole of Nigeria, but just the surface we've scratched in our little time of existence, we've been able to at least regain some trust in some industries where you know if you get a piece of, um, if you get somebody's ID, and you verify it through our portal, at least you have some confidence that you're dealing with the person that's sitting in front of you. So that's just one way, and I won't take up everybody's time, so I'll pass on to the next lady sitting next to me. All right, you can pass the mic up to her. Uh, let's, let's hear from you. You are into the business sector. Your firm is in business, and you work with both businesses and also the government agencies as well. Tell us, what kind of solutions do you envisage? What kind of solutions are you providing and how do you think we can do things more? Yeah. No, no, I, I mean you. Okay, um, thank you so much. So interestingly enough, I was going to come at the first question similarly to Simi, mm. right? Um, what we realized as a business after dealing with um, the government as a technology partner across a large scale, you know, a, a bunch of large scale programs, what we realized was that there is really no way to manage the complexity of cities, like the social contract between the government and the people. There's no other way to manage it except through technology. Um, what we found out and what we learned from delivering an empire, for example, which is like the, I would say the largest social impact program that the government has undertaken, um, what we found out was that every bit of that experience from recruitment to enabling the beneficiaries to prepare for their role giving them the capacity development that they needed. It had to be powered by technology end to end. And when you mix in COVID-19 with that and citizens' expectations based on that, everybody wants convenience. Everybody wants a way to interact with their government. Everybody wants to be able to sign up for a PVC, a driver's license, CAC, do things in a seamless way. Um, I think those are some of just a few things that we have learned. Now to the question of, um, sorry, I'm so sorry, could you, could you repeat that just to be sure? I'm okay, right so track. let's look at the challenges you faced, okay? So okay. now you tell us the prospect, tell us about the challenges you faced and how right. you're addressing these challenges or your solutions. Okay, um, in terms of challenges, I would say, you know, respectfully, there are, I would maybe class them into three buckets. Um, first is bureaucracy. Or maybe let me just even start from a foundational point, right? Orientation. When you interact with 
the average government official, you know, you have a solution, you're trying to push it, you're trying to become a technology partner. What we find is that there's an initial resistance, there is a suspicion almost um, of technology maybe replacing jobs or, you know, them not having the same level of authority if technology comes into play. So I would say that there's a fundamental issue around orientation and culture. You know, the process that we have right now allows for a lack of transparency. And technology really stands to disrupt that. So I think fundamentally, we just need to look inward, as, and I'm speaking to the government now, look inward find the principles that we're trying to operate on. What are the values that we're trying to operate on? We want to deliver better services to the people. Technology is an enabler for that. It's not a threat, it's an enabler. So how we try to solve for that, you know, solve for orientation, bureaucracy, and um, just some of the challenges that we've encountered in our process is we really try to co-create. We don't come, we are soft come that is. We don't come with, this is the solution, this is how it works. We sit down with the people that are actually going to use it. How is this going to work for you? Um, we go through a discovery process, understand what exists in the parastatal MDA, state government office, that we're dealing with per time. What is the process that exists as is? And where do we want to take you to? And then we have like change management sessions. So it's not just technology for technology's sake. It's really a, it's a mutual creation of a solution. So how are you coming at us with your problems? How are we coming at understanding the context of what you're trying to achieve and how are we designing a solution that takes into cognizance all of these things? That's how we solve. Well, that's just great. Um, Thank you. Emanuela, I can't forget your name because it's similar to mine. Uh, you work, you function, or you create services for micro and small businesses. Um, tell us, how has the adopt, what's the like, adoption like you know, of tech in that space? And what more would you want the government to do to improve what you do? All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'll first start by saying that most of the times when people hear micro and small businesses, they will always think of these businesses on the streets, these businesses that are like petty trading, right? And then they leave out the, um, the type of small businesses and type of micro businesses that are being run by young people using social media. So social commerce businesses, that is a type of small and micro business. And when it comes to technology, these people are already using technology to run their businesses. They're using technology to, to communicate. They're using technology in certain aspects of their finance already. It makes sense that they're using technology for their businesses as well. So when it comes to adoption, it's very easy for this type of businesses to, or this type of business owners to adopt technology. And then even moving to um, people on the streets, there are different type of tech, um, there are different ways to use technology to penetrate wherever you want to get to, right? So it's not always a mobile app or a web app. There, you, there's USSD, there's a lot of ways to um, use technology to bridge the gap between companies, the government, and the people. And so um, with technology, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of resistance when it comes to adopting what makes people's lives easier, what makes it easier to run their business, there is no um, real resistance to that. Um, where the resistance is, is um, how much information they give and how, pro how protected that kind of um, information is. And what can become easier is a general, um, a general, um, a unified um, method of identification in terms of like um, our addressing system and um, our identity per, per a human that exists. 
So we don't have to have um, multiple types of identities or you're not having those gaps where people are having multiple, multiple identity numbers for the same type of identity and you're not having issues where people think that giving this type of identity means that they've compromised a lot and then I would even say, contrary to popular opinion, that I, or rather contrary to what um, sometimes people might think, is that I do like regulation when it comes to financial services because it protects people. So the type of, so like when, um, when the regulation, like the type of regulation that happens, say, let me take BVN for, for instance, being able to communicate what BVN means to a, an average person because people t have BVNs but they don't necessarily understand that this is an identification number and this is the kind of access you give a person when you give them your BVN. Sometimes they overblot what it means to, what a BVN number, what a BV number means, sorry, and sometimes they underrate what it means. So being like that general education that is coming from both the private sector and the government to saying that this is um, how far we have gone to protect you, I think is very important. All right, thank you very much. We'll go on to uh, Mr. Adewale right now. Uh, you are the CEO of Computer Warehouse Group, CWG, and you rose through the ranks. You know, I believe you have first-hand experience with integrating technology into commercial enterprises. Uh, what obstacles do you foresee that could hinder a successful tech adoption in your field you know, in Nigeria and Africa at large? And then you can give us some of the solutions that you think we can harness. All right, thank you so much. Uh, first, I must congratulate the organizers of this program. I think we need more sessions, we need more mechanisms and platforms like this to be able to propel the kind of growth we're anticipating. Uh, and that's the reason why we're here. But more importantly for me also, we be the, uh, the outcome of an engagement like this. Uh, the need for accurate documentation, uh, compilation of the thought process that will come out from this engagement to be on the right table, uh, the many agencies and power starters uh, for, for appropriation, uh, because that is only when we can get the true benefits of people living their busy life and coming to join us here today. Uh, before I answer your question, I must say if you're in this room today, then you're not particularly new to the new wave of digital technology innovation that we're experiencing in Sub-Saharan Africa and by extension in Africa. Uh, I call it something quite remarkable. Uh, the, the emergence of the fintech organizations and the use of technology, the use of innovation in healthcare, uh, e-commerce, uh, agriculture, and so many other industries. Uh, it's a time that I consider very good for the continent of Africa. Uh, I mean, in, in recent times, beyond football, and uh, beyond the news of corruption, we are standing on global stage where we are being discussed and uh, we are getting global attention on what exactly is happening, happening when it comes to digital innovation in Africa. So I think it's something we must celebrate. And if you're talking about the adoption of uh, this digital innovation in my line of business and the application of our job, uh, the first thing I would say is we're leaving value on the table. And I call it the, the arrogance of the private sector or the arrogance of the tech industry. Uh, I call it the abnormality of the tech industry, where we see so much wealth in what we're doing, but we are not so much ready to get into active engagement in, with the major stakeholders that will make this happen. I think we're spending a lot of time creating the many things we are doing, which is incredible, but we're not spending enough time discussing with the people that will make that to happen. Uh, in every economy, regulation is always a major thing that either propel what you're doing or frustrate what you're doing. Uh, part of my job, uh, a large part of my job is working with promoters uh, of, of uh, banks to set up new entity and new banks. And I can say I've, in the last two years, I've probably conveniently done more than four of that. 
If you understand the process it takes to set up a bank today in terms of the regulation and things you need to put in place, you would then understand the need why there need to be proper structure in place also for the tech innovation uh, industry. Uh, if we see the, the wealth or the, the need for us to grow this industry, then we must also pay equal attention as we do to creativity, we must pay equal attention also to the regulation of the same. And I heard the, f the second keynote speaker, and I, I agree with 99% of every other thing he said. Uh, but the aspect of then, when he says something about you must come to us, maybe those are some of the few areas uh, I feel a little bit indifferent. Because if you so much also believe that you're not doing me a favor, I would clearly see this as a way to actually increase uh, the, the prosperity of this nation. Then it's not a case of me coming to you, it's a case of a careful deliberation between all stakeholders because there's something in for everyone. Exactly. Uh, but precisely to our organization, I think I've said it in previous forums like this before, our own definition of innovation is not anything out of this world. Uh, so we are not in any way going to the moon for you to go bring out what is not missing. We're not doing that. We think we have a lot, so much of those challenges in sub-Saharan Africa and Africa today that we think technology can help to bridge that gap. So focus for us slightly is how do we use technology, what's the application of technology in the everyday troubles and challenges that we see in the life of an average Nigeria today, what are those things that when we plug in technology, you could suddenly see a movement that you could clearly anticipate a better life as a result of the application of technology in that space. It hasn't been the best of, of experience in terms of where we are right now, but I will also be very insincere if I say we've not made some remarkable milestone in the last three to five years. And I'll be glad to speak to that subsequently in the course of this conversation. All right, thank you so much, sir. Uh, you know, when I was sitting here and the NITA DG made that comment, somebody sighed behind me and I was smiling. Why? Because you agree that there's a gap, you know, between the government and the tech startups. And then you said they have to come to me to tell me what you're doing. No, I believe that we have to meet halfway. That is how I see things. I don't know if you share the same belief, sir. Um, you are in the automobile industry and you are into ele um, electric vehicles, right? You're the CEO of Jet Motors, correct? So you're into electric vehicles. And how would you say has it been you know, working with the government, your relationship with the government to adopt this in? Thank you. Yes, let me first of all start from what you said that uh, if, if gap exists, you, the, the two uh, uh, entities that are in two different locations have to meet midway. But if the regulator thinks everybody has to come to them, it will be difficult for them to regulate. What of those people that decide not to come? Are you going to take them out? So, I, and I, if you don't want to go to them, you will find it difficult to acquire the knowledge of how they operate. And for you to be able to regulate properly, you need to regulate from the point of knowledge. Having said that, come back to uh, my own industry. We, we came in with, uh, we introduced electric vehicle into Nigerian market, especially the cargo van. And we knew this is the future of mobility. We knew as at that time that there are going to be challenges. And we knew we need to start confronting those challenges. We, we, we have to confront those challenges with technology. Let me first of all start from the first challenge we have to face. For you to operate in our industry, you have to be licensed and the licensing process is done annually. So the process, it takes you some time. It can take you four months, five months, before you finish that process of uh, licensing. So by the time you finish it, you are almost gone through the 12 month period. So you start all over again. This is something the regulator can easily look at and say, we can make the process seamless. We can digitalize it 
you can sit down in your office, apply, and be able to monitor the process, upload the necessary document, and, and monitor it from your own office. You don't need to go to Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade, Custom, and all these things to get your, li your license. So it's, it shouldn't be working that way. One other thing we, 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 we notice for EV to succeed in Nigeria, for example, you have energy. And then if you are regulating energy and the, the way it is na now, we need uh, energy to be uh, not necessarily be on national grid. Everybody can start generating their own energy. And that's what we have been preaching to them. And I know the, the, they are responding. Because now uh, you can have your own inverter, you can have your own solar, but we want it to go a bit higher. We want government to, to start talking and talking to investors in this area because investors are not going to come if they are not so sure of the kind of regulation you have in place. They are going to protect their own investment. This is the area where regulators have to work on. You have to come up with a policy that will protect the investors. No, nobody will want to invest in that kind of industry when they are not so sure of the kind of policy you have in place. For example, you have a policy today, another government coming, or even the same government, within the same cycle, government can change that policy. You are halfway, you have invested billions of naira, and they change that policy along the line. It makes it a bit difficult. But for all, what we have been trying to do is we try to engage government we try to be closer to, to the uh, council that regulate uh, uh, vehicle and automobile industry in Nigeria, which is NADDC. We try to explain ourselves to them. We want to know their position on everything we are doing. And from there, we are able to close the gap. And if there is anything we think they are not doing well, we try as much as possible to explain our own position. And sometimes, they also come back and explain their own position to us. From there, we were able to close those gaps. Thank you. All right. You. Thank you so much. Um, we'll go now to you, Professor. Uh, I read something that you, a publication you and two other authors did about soy prediction using artificial intelligence. Yes. So it really thrilled me. <laughs> it really thrilled me, you know, knowing that you're a former advisor to the Ekiti State Government as well. So can you tell us about this? You've heard our conversations. You listen to the NITDA DG speak about regulation. You listen to the Lagos State Government tell us about their vision for Lagos State. What do you think about that? Well, thank you very much. And once again, let me thank the organizer of this. I, I think one thing we we are living too late, is that this conversation started a bit late for many operators in the system. I mean, when we talk, you do all of this, Nigeria is an environment where there's so much creation happening. But you leave the higher education institutions out of the whole discussion. They get to understand what it means much late. And I, my experience came from serving in in government. I think it's really regulated my thinking about what kind of things we deliver to the society and what it means. I found out our system does not really allow the, most of the graduates to think and we stiffen the process of innovation within the system. So, and we apply, for instance, we try to apply uh, in drug distribution while I was serving in the Kitty State, we were looking at the, the kind of finance the state has, and we were looking at making drug readily accessible to everybody within that state. So we created what we call the Blue Roof Hospital, about 171 of them. And we wanted to have an integrated system that monitors drug delivery, so that we just have maybe three central stores, and we can do inventory management right from... It was such a challenge, and I think my sister already mentioned it. There was first the problem of culture. Almost everybody doesn't believe, and everybody, you are coming to take my, uh, my authority away. Now, computer will be doing what I'm naturally supposed to be doing. And again, because the underlying corruption issue also, everything becomes more transparent. But 
in retrospect, I found out the challenge is that many people who are participating in that sector didn't know so much about it beforehand. And so they are now afraid that this... But, and I look at the environment where we are competing with. These things have been part of the process. Innovation, thinking is part of the process. And so when I returned back to the university, I made it a first challenge to me. First, for, as a person, I don't give student project topic again. If you have studied this course for four years, for instance, and you don't have something you want to contribute, then it's not worth studying it. And I found out over the last 10 years I've done it, I have produced almost 20 inventions, just allowing the guys to think on their own. Not because I only guide them. Some of the time I don't even know what they are going to do. So like the, the soil mapping using uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. When the young man came to me, I challenged all of them. One challenge about collecting soil data, for instance, is if you want to, if you want to take soil sample to just estimate fertility of a soil, you can spend the next three months just collecting sample over uh, maybe one 10,000 hectares. 10,000 hectares is so big to a Nigerian person, but I've worked in Brazil on 1.1 million hectares of land where they plant uh, just eucalyptus. So I imagine if we now want to do 20,000 hectares, what is going to happen? So I told the young men, please, all of you, think. Can we do something that we can use existing data to do some prediction? And this young man took it up. I mean, he was bringing the thing I was reading. I was just encouraging him and also reading along. Because the reality is that all of us have to learn. It's something new. That, so I was learning as a young man was learning. And today you saw the, the, the work. is being published in an A1 journal of showing that what this young man a graduating student has done is very real. So the, the reality is that we left this conversation for too long and very unfortunately in Nigeria we're having so many things happening but up to today all of the creation happening, most of them are not talking back to the universities. We, I saw the Lagos State Government official talk. I, I'm, I'm so appreciative because I think Lagos is a model for many of us in Nigeria to copy. But I think they will also do stronger if they take this thing back, even from their secondary school. Can we begin to have those creativity hub, even from secondary school? So that we are talking about it together, and as we go forward, it, 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 regulation becomes a normal thing that we can all see together. Thank you. Okay, I, I think one thing that most of us will agree with today is that uh, when the questions were thrown at the government officials here, you know, every one of us were here. When they responded, it was more like they were defending themselves. You know, they were defending themselves than actually saying, oh, okay, I take that. I think we should work in this area. I, I didn't see anything like that. So it goes to the question, how can we provide solution, you know, for smart governance? What do you think is a solution we can provide right now? We've talked about the problems. We've talked about the places that affect us in our own different industry, our own different field. What are the solutions we can explore at this very moment? Because uh, time is no longer in our hands. We need to get these things right now or in the next two, three, four years is going to be a major challenge. Like I said, we should have done this earlier. But we're here right now. So what are the solutions? So I'll start from you, Professor, then we'll go down. Okay, I think we started this also. I think I gave some instance. Yes. Number one, let this innovation process flow through so that we don't leave the discussion until much later. And we need a lot of cultural change. If the real challenge between the tech industry and the government is this issue of culture. We need, we need to re invest a lot of time, a lot of resources into getting people oriented about development. Once we can do that, and we must be conscious about it. It's not just something that happened. We must be conscious that we want to get this done and look at how do you communicate with each sphere of, this, of the government. I mean, 
the same language I used to remember one of my professors, he said two times two is not always equal to four. Because his answer is it depends. So depending on who you are talking to, you must find the language that best address what their fear is and speak it to them in such a way that they understand it. And the second thing, my sister equally mentioned it. Technology is not just about coming to tell you you are stupid. You didn't know what you were doing. But we are saying we can work together and do something better that will live the future better than we met it. All right, Emmanuel, let's go for you. Um, okay, so one of the things that I think will, because a lot of people have mentioned the gap between the government and the tech sector, and I think there's something that will bridge that is um, the government having operators, right? Existing operators or operators like mature operators in the tech ecosystem, working with them, working in their agencies. I think that the kind of regulation, the direction of the regulation, and the um, the different levels or severity of the regulations will become better just by having operators in their agencies. Because what that means is that these people understand what is going on in the tech space, the direction that it's going to, and they can better, um, they can better translate that when, um, rather the regulations can be better translated when they are involved in the process. It's not always easy to say, oh, the government and the people in, um, in the, techno, in the tech sector should always be coming together and always having those discussions. Those are important, but having operators as part of that process of regulation, I believe that is going to be like a game changer when it comes to um, the regulatory landscape. Okay, let's hear from you. Yeah, I mean, I think that forums like this is a good start where we have the opportunity to engage with regulators despite what we <laughs> despite what we hear them um, or how they take that feedback at least there is a forum to engage there's a forum to have these discussions in the long term um, there's a real opportunity to I would say like Emanuela said honestly plant tech technocrats in um, in government spaces because it's very, very important to, to have that shared understanding of this is innovation, this is something that we can catch on to. It doesn't need to take four months to regulate um, the electric vehicle industry. It doesn't need to take that long. How can we innovate? How can we learn from best practices? And also looking outside Nigeria, when we look at, you know, maybe other countries in Africa that are doing these things, when we look at Kenya, Rwanda, how do we, how do we learn from them? Of course, we understand that our problems are peculiar. Um, we have to take those things into consideration, but what can we learn and how can we apply them into our own policy frameworks? I think that would help. Okay, so talking about other countries, you know, I'm very particular and very concerned about brain drain in Nigeria. You see, because um, most of the people, even though we know that to an extent a lot of persons can stretch the law and make things work for them here in Nigeria and benefit more, you know, um, there's still that area, there's still that part whereby a lot of persons want to go outside the country and try it more. I think I heard an example from the DG or so, you know, want to go outside the country and do things from there and just let the Nigeria be on its own. And that is my great concern. Um, Simi, you tell us, um, though the same question, the solutions, we're looking at solutions right now, but from the regulatory angle, you've heard everything that has been said here. You've been here since the very beginning of the program. Are there particular policies, are there particular regulations that concern you, that makes you worried? Um, I wish the regulators who were here were still here. Because um, something that, as a lawyer, I always question is the fact that whenever we have new regulations and policies, they tend to look like borrowed policies from different jurisdictions. And I say this because um, you look at, let's use the NITA for instance, it's, it reads almost like a copy and paste of the EU GDPR. 
But it doesn't take into context the local circumstances, the climate. Are these things plausible in Nigeria? Have we reached the stage where we should be talking about these specific things? It seems very high functioning, but then typically you find that in the process of trying to enact a law, all of that, we ideally you should look at how it's been done elsewhere. But you have to adapt it to the local climate. You can't just say there's A, B, C, D, do A, B, C, D, or else you will be erring. No. A, does it work in Nigeria? Does it even work in, let's use Lagos as a model state? Is it obtainable? When you ask those questions, you realize that, fine, we need a regulation because obviously it, makes, it gives for security of whoever is an operator or a player in that industry, but what does this specific industry need? And that's something that tends to be lacking because what we're trying to do is just to check a box and say, yes, we have a regulation for this particular industry. Now, go out and do whatever you think is relevant to achieve this objective. But really, is this even attainable? That's my main fear as a lawyer and someone who actually is in the operations aspect of a business. Is this where it, and I think the gentleman who spoke about the electric cars said something about the fact that it takes so long, but then when you do take, so, it takes so long, when you eventually get the final products, you look at it and you say, what is this in front of me? How is this going to help my business? And I, I don't know who asked the question earlier, but I, I think I get a sense of why the person was asking or saying the thing about Lagos State frustrating businesses. It looks like a frustration because from the, from the ground level, you're already, it already seems like you're set up to fail because you can't even meet the requirements of the standard, which is the regulation. So for me, that's where we need to start from. Ask ourselves, is this practical for the circumstance that we find ourselves, or Nigeria of 2022, not Nigeria of 2030, when things get in place, or we hope that they get in place, the Nigeria of now. So that's just my own main concern. Okay, so um, Mr. Dewale, <laughs> what is your thought on this? You've heard what she said. What, what do you take, make of that? Uh, first, uh, not in defense of the regulators, uh, but pr probably because I'm privileged to know some few things as a result of the few works that I do for them. Uh, and I can say there's been a lot of improvement in the last five years. Uh, if you go to NCC, for example, I'm not sure if any of their reps are here. Uh, I'm privileged over the years to uh, have some few sessions with the board of NCC in the last three years. And if you get into the details of some of the initiatives and policies that have been formulated in these quarters, you tend to understand then why we're not seeing the immediate benefits in the everyday life of uh, everyone in here today. Uh, but, but, but having said that, I must comment a little bit about what Prof said initially. Uh, my question, Prof, by extension of what you said, will have been after the publication in the, in the big uh, magazine, uh, then what next? That, that's, what, yeah, that's what I will have said, because I think there's need for more uh, active or more engaging or deliberate apparatus or mechanism for some level of uh, active collaboration between the private and the uh, public sector, which by extension would be the regulators. And that's why I said, and I must be fair to say this, to say there's also a little bit of arrogance coming in from the private sector, which by extension the tech ecosystem, uh, where we believe by default that some things happen to be our right and something should come to us because we believe so much in the uh, ingenious creativity and the tenacity of the work we've put in place to produce that thing that has given us that global presence. And suddenly we believe we deserve the right to be served and somebody should put the meal on our table uh, for us to eat. So I think also that needs to be taken away. There must be a very active, there's a place for lobbying in any active economy. Uh, uh, institution build any, any engaging and prosperous economy. So there's a place where the tech industry almost must come to that realization and get to that place of lobbying 
in order to see and bring some things to life. Uh, and also, with Madam, I also completely agree on the issue of there can be a plug and play. But I personally don't see a problem with uh, copying models from different parts of the world. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, it happens everywhere in the world. The trouble then will be, if I've gone to copy, then I must be able to talk to the relevant stakeholders to say what are the plus and minuses before we put this into place. And we can now see how that can actually work in our environment. Uh, having said that, my, my last comment on this also will be the, the place of understanding what I call the drivers of every economy. In every advanced society that you have, they are drivers of every society. They are drivers of every organization. Uh, we all work or own different businesses today. You clearly understand the drivers and the fundamentals of your business. In Nigeria today as a country, they are drivers of this country. By the time you take trade, you take diaspora transfer, capital inflow, policy happen to be one of the very strategic parts of drivers of this economy. Under policies where you have the fiscal policies and the monetary policy, which by extension goes to the financial markets where you have the equity market and the fixed income markets that largely drive our exchange rates today, largely drive our interest rate, largely drives inflation. Uh, if you want to know about policy, then talk to folks in the U.S. right now on the impact of Fed's increasing rates. Then you understand the impact of policy in nation building. Where am I going with this? My point is regulation then becomes something very critical that will determine whether we move forward or we don't move forward in this whole conversation. So it must be deliberate. And I think the private sector also must provide a fair share into this conversation. My only conversation to governments, after giving that good remark about what they are doing, will be, if I suddenly tell them that I found gold at the back of my house, will they wait for me to come to them or they will come to my house to say, how big is this gold that you just found at the back of your house? What we are saying in the tech industry, it's, we just found gold. That's what we are saying, that we just found this oil, oil well, that's what we are saying. So if we found the oil well, we can't come to you because it's an oil well. So we must meet and discuss to say, how do we provide the level of the digital prosperity that I think is necessary for the continent of Africa uh, for us to propel the kind of growth that we're looking at? It takes a lot of job, I can assure you of that, but just like every good thing, it's not going to be something we wake up and tomorrow morning we're suddenly there. We must contribute our fair share and government also must do what is important. Institutions build nation, Institutions are necessary for nation building and for prosperity of any uh, civilized environment. And that's the same thing that must happen in this place. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one thing I will say before we pass the mic and then we take the questions is this. Uh, my engagement with some of the persons in the tech sector, their opinion is this, and I'll say it the way they said it. They said, the government, the oil is done. Let me even use pigeon English, sorry guys, let me use pigeon. Oh yeah, don't finish. Eh? Now, now take night day. The government is just seen, uh, just looking for a way. They've had uh, the tech guys now have been able to get seed funding of 60 something, 600 and something million dollars, you know, and they want to be, they want part of that money. They want to be involved. And that is why these engagements are coming and they are trying to feel like, oh, we're here for you, we want to talk to you, we want to see how we can regulate the sector. That is the whole mindset down there. You see, and he, they come in here to say that we want you to come to us. It's a whole different thing entirely. So if you, if you permit me just for 30 seconds, and it's important I mention this okay. because of the example that you gave. And I still call it the arrogance of the tech industry because no matter the brilliancy of your solution, it must be riding on an existing platform for you to drive. And I've been there before, where we spent several years, got some huge investment on a particular initiative, signed like three, four banks, and someday CBN woke up and said, this is a new direction. Yet if we didn't have the bandwidth to actually uh, weather that storm, 
Uh, I probably won't be here today. I probably might be connecting for my uh, McDonald's uh, job somewhere in the U.S. and connecting to you. My point in this is that you must understand what we call the DNA of every society. Uh, and it's, it's, it differs in every country. In Nigeria today, the private sector, just like we have a mix of it in the U.S., where we have the uh, uh, Silicon Valley and, and the government driving technology, in Nigeria today, the private sector drives technology and regulators are playing the catch-up game. It's not going to change, and you're going to live in this place and walk in this place. So, because of the attention that we think we've gotten on the global stage, it has gotten us also to that place of arrogance where we think, like I said, we have to be served. In Singapore, for example, it's not the same. Government is driving tech, and you see the private sector following. Understanding the DNA is the same way you understand the DNA of your organization. The same way you organize, understand the DNA of your house, because you clearly understand the kind of wife you married or the kids that you have, and you navigate the politics in the home. You have to navigate the politics also that we have in Nigeria today, because the DNA is we lead, and the regulators are playing a catch-up game. It's not going to change. So if we come here also and encourage so much of this arrogance, I think we're making the journey longer, and probably more frustrating. But the more consciousness that we build into this space where we allow technocrats and techpreneurs to understand the need for that active collaboration, uh, I can tell you in 24 months when we're back to this space, we have a better story to tell. And I apologize for taking your time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, so no, so, no, so no just, just tell us, um, what solution, what are those things you hope to see? You know, when the government is saying regulation, we've come to a conclusion right now that the regulation is good, okay? But it is the right regulation. So what are those things you hope to see? Okay. Uh, let me start by saying uh, both parties, that is the government, the regulate, regulators, and the regulated, must understand two things. They must be able to answer two questions. Why regulation? And how do I regulate? So why regulation? The, the, for both parties, if the government or the regulator understand why they need to regulate, they will know the actions to take. They will know how to go about it. If they don't know, they will ask questions. And the regulated also, when they could answer that question, why regulation? that bit of arrogance, they will discard it and then move toward the regulator. Because if both parties couldn't answer that question properly, there is going to be these uh, issues that both of them will try to hold their own side. The regulator will hold their own side. Let them do. If I don't understand what they are doing, I will just kill it. And that's how so, some of the operators see the regulator that immediately they don't understand what I'm doing. The best thing for them is kill it so they will come to us. So again, the regulators, when they understand that, why are we doing this? You are doing this to protect the system, to protect the society, to protect individual, to protect the, even the regulated. So if you know this, then you need to go ahead to ask questions. Then how will I do it? In knowing how to do it, you need to engage everyone. You need to engage the operators. You need to. Uh, you mentioned something like uh, having the DNA of every uh, uh, society in this place. How do I do it? It's different from the way U.S. is doing theirs. It's different from, from the way Rwanda is doing theirs. How will I go about it? In knowing how to go about it, you need to engage everyone. You need to speak to the stakeholders. And even the regulated also cannot say, I'm going to sit down and own my own position. You need to go to them and speak to them. Because you are looking for solutions. Both of us are looking for solutions. Everybody wants to grow the market. Everybody wants to grow the economy. Everybody wants the tax pay to improve. So if you want that, you need to sit down together and explain the how. You, we need to expand our knowledge. And it is knowing the how that we are going to expand our knowledge. Because if I know that, for me to regulate this, I don't have the basic knowledge of doing that. And for me to acquire that knowledge, if I need to take, employ some of the experts, I need that. In, in, in the industry where I, 
I operate, the, the Director General of NADDC is an expert. So when you are talking, you already, already understand, even before you say it, you already understand the problem we are facing from other ministries. So we can easily call and say, Oga Komo, your people. You will be able to work because you understand what it takes. You understand what times mean. You understand how the process works. So that's why I think the best way, let's answer those questions, why do we regulate? And when you know why the regulators have to regulate you, you the regulated, you will be open to them. You will be able to be sincere with them. You will be transparent with them. And when you know their inadequacies, you'll be ready to provide solution and cover up by providing necessary knowledge or necessary aids that you need to provide to the, the regulators. Because, sincerely speaking, a lot of regulators don't understand what we are saying. And if they don't understand, if you think they don't understand and you are going to leave them that way, they are going to jeopardize our own investment. They are going to jeopardize our own future. Just, That's why we need to Just 30 seconds, sir. Thank you. 30 seconds. So one point. I, I, I completely agree with what you are saying. And I think one area where I support so much the idea of lobbying, the problem we are even having is over-regulation. Almost everybody comes out with new rule because the city is an evolving industry. Everybody wants to be relevant to that industry. And I think we need more lobbying around that area to let's get together to talk. If we talk, this, what you are saying, this other organization is saying, this other organization is saying, and everybody is saying different things. So I think we need more of this conversation talking so that overregulation is even the issue now. Now everybody wants to be in the tech space. We are relevant. Everybody is relevant. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Saz. Um, before we go, I would like to take some few questions, maybe two, three questions. Okay, I can see a hand there. Uh, Let's get your opinions on this. I can see on that hand here. Yeah? Okay, so let's start with the man with the, with the cap, please. Thank you. Okay, um, just, just introduce yourself. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. My name is Favor Chukwedo. I'm a founder of DigiLens, and um, I also help you know, with, can you turn this down a bit? My name is Favor. I'm the founder of DigiLens. Um, my question is to my question is to um, the CEO of CWG. Um, your, your your feedback was quite interesting, but I was I was sort of taken aback when you said um, there's a bit of arrogance by members. Can we take this down? You said there was a bit of arrogance by members of... There's a bit of arrogance by members of the tech ecosystem. Okay, maybe we need another mic, please. Or oh, you move forward, please. Just move forward. Move forward. Okay, let's try it here. So, um, you said there's a bit of arrogance by members of the tech ecosystem. But I, th I think the issue here is about... The I think the issue here is about the government or um, policymakers trying to play catch-up to the existing reality. Um, I was also surprised when you said you would have gone to work with McDonald's. It felt like you had an alternative. What about a young person that is trying to um, innovate around education that doesn't have an alternative but is being faced by a policy that is going to stop him from innovating? Take, for example, um, my startup, right, provides quality learning content to out of, and this is not the enemies of marketing here, provides quality content to out of school students that don't have smartphones or internet devices. But a big challenge for us now is from um, the likes of the MNOs, for example, you know, across the cost of um, SMS and USSD. I think now it's about seven naira and a few um, couple for a session. 
vigilance will not be where we are if we didn't have support. But there is an existing policy that the government can actually put in place that talks about startups that are providing you know, social impact services can kind of enjoy maybe it's zero rated air times for, your, for products built on SMS and USSD. So I, I, I really want to maybe still get your feedback. Do you really think it's still the arrogance by members of the tech ecosystem or the government trying to play catch up? Or do you think the arrogance is maybe because they don't have alternatives? They don't maybe have a McDonald's where they can run back to? Yeah? All right. Uh, is there any the other, the other man there? So we'll just take the questions, then we'll do the answers and we'll oh, go. Do they respond to questions before? Uh, okay, let's get this question so that we can do everything at once. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is um, George Akari Emmanuel. And um, first of all, I'm, I'm concerned about um, the fact that um, Nigeria is um, regarded um, when we have uh, shoes like this, um, we are normally regarded as talkatives. We don't, um, you know, walk towards what we discuss. My concern is, um, you know, the plans of the organizers of this uh, program, how to follow up every bit of discussion we have here. And, um, you know, I actually want to see maybe um, towards this time next year, there's a particular time we're going to have another program. We have um, you know, uh, something to write to me about, about this um, particular um, um, gathering. And the second um, concern I'm having is about um, these um, regulators um, thing. Most of um, the, regulate, uh, the regulatory agency that we have, they have been given a stipulated, um, how do I call it, a target at times. They give them a particular target so they actually um, level up on any startup um, company or whatever that they see. And they uh, try to use up the opportunity to meet up with the particular targets they have. How do we think we can you know, um, um, address this issue? Do you okay. get my question, please? OK, I, I think we got that. Um, sir, please, start from the first question so that um uh, just give us the time. We're nearly out of time, but go on, sir, Mr. Tewale. Okay, first, thank you for that question, and uh, I'll make a little bit of clarification to my comment about the arrogance of the tech industry. Uh, first, I must say I'm in the same world, so when I say the arrogance of the tech industry, I'm also referring to myself. And the reason why I have to emphasize on that is largely because uh, I have so many sweet stories I could tell you today to encourage you and tell uh, the picture I'm trying to paint is the need for us to also make a shift uh, before we can have any meaningful progress. Uh, and I've been there. When I say I've been there is I've been in situations where I think I deserve more. Uh, I was in a similar engagement like this in, in my many engagements. And in a room of over 100 people, uh, which is outside this country, uh, a professor was trying to make illustration about dynamic 16 thinking and was trying to use uh, the issue of pandemic. That was before the COVID situation. And of course, he went to Africa, then he started talking about Ebola. And in the course of the conversation, immediately he mentioned that do we have anyone from Liberia in here? And there was no one. But my lousy professor at the back that I felt I was trying to make some contact with for some conversation after the program, shouted at the back of the hall and said, Adewale, from Nigeria. And I had to stand before the crowd of over 200 people to explain what exactly is Ebola and use the application of uh, the dynamic system thinking to demonstrate Ebola. Before that time, we've had people from Sweden come to illustrate how homeless people and poverty level, it's no longer being measured in percentage in Sweden, Austria, and some other European countries, but it's being measured in numbers. So you can imagine somebody leaving that stage, and there comes a me in our usual arrogant Nigeria way, where we are all well-dressed, you know the Nigerian thing, and the only thing I could describe in that space is talking about Ebola. 
My point is, when I had a next opportunity for that in a similar environment, and this time around, I was meant to come and talk about the new wave of digital prosperity in Africa. This time around, in a bigger audience. Trust me, I didn't wish that opportunity. They had to remind me that I only have 10 minutes. My point is, returning to Nigeria, that's an endorsement for me. Because on a global stage, somebody just acknowledged the fact that we are doing something great. My expectation at that point is even my government will not acknowledge what we are doing. So I could sit very calmly in my office waiting for the right time for government to come to me to do this. My point in this is let's make that move also. Let there be some active collaboration. Let there be some active engagement. Let's put some governance and structure in place within the tech industry where we have bodies that can even speak on our behalf. If I go for an agenda today, very likely there are people in this room that will say because it doesn't favor their own industry or business, then that's not the position of the tech industry. Some level of structure needs to come into this space. A last comment also on this, my good friend, will be, you know, it's easy when you see it from your side also. Because also, because of the kind of job that I do, I consult for banks, some certain policies, policies are there to protect you, even while you are doing that innovation. If I tell you the volume of bank fraud that we have today, either enterprise employee fraud or cyber attacks, that you don't see on the pages of newspaper, you will not remain on your seat. You will not remain on your seat if I tell you the volume that we're looking at. And these are things that some of these financial institutions don't even have an answer to. So when you see regulators respond sometimes, you are seeing it from the point of why would this be, be, be in place to frustrate what we are doing? The other side of what you're seeing is a 20 billion Naira has just left three commercial banks in the last three months because of that loophole that they need to cover. So goes back to the question, when we talk, it's important that we now understand why you do what you do. And I also say, we not talking is we leaving money on the table because we are not talking. So I, 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 I think I spent some time trying to understand, trying to explain what I meant by that arrogance of the tech industry, but in, is in the light of active collaboration with regulators. And I'm happy to discuss with you further uh, after this uh, session. OK. You can use the other mic. I think there's another mic there. Just turn it on. OK. Um, OK, so I. So I'm going to say that I think that um, the word arrogance might not be the exact word because I do not know anybody in the tech industry who is against being regulated. I think that some of the issues is how to approach the regulators. There's no really clear line in how you're going to engage with regulators. And people in the tech industry, they want to engage regulators. They're not running away from it. They are not saying regulators should come and meet us. Nobody hates regulation because we understand that it is protecting both our businesses and our customers. And then, um, but sometimes with this regulation, when there is no exact understanding of the intricacies of the business and a regulation just comes up, it is it's actually quite shocking. And especially with financial services, I don't think there's anybody who is in the financial sector who doesn't understand the volume of fraud that goes on in the financial sector. But when you come out and then you see regulations that have no empathy for the kind of business you are doing, there is no way that that person is going to just keep quiet and say, oh, I did not engage, uh, and that is why it is happening. And a proof that the tech industry actually wants to regulate, it wants to be involved with regulators, is the startup bill. 
It started from the tech industry, they organized themselves together, came together, um, sought out representatives, came out with, drafted a bill by themselves, and then, uh, and then presented it, which has now, I think, has gotten to the second house or so. So it's not like, I don't think there's anybody who is active in the tech industry who does not necessarily want to be regulated. The line of communication is not clear, and that is where the problem is. So I think that the, 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 um, the word should probably not be, um, arrogance because you run a, a, a company that's sort of B2G and B2B, so it's probably easier for you to engage with this type of people. There are people who do not have that sort of privilege to be able to work into any government institution or to be able to say, hey, how can I meet X and X person from um, this place? And so those are some of the issues that are happening, not necessarily that people are just being arrogant and do not want to be regulated. Yeah, I think to buttress her point, um, earlier today we had a little pool here where people who knew, people, everyone was asked if you know the right, the people to reach out to if you have any issues, you know, as regards tech and nobody raised their hands, you see. So that shows that there is definitely a gap in communication, okay, between the government and the tech, um, the tech space. Um, can we take one more question? Uh, okay. Could say what? Just one. Okay, so we had this. Um, the the person in the middle row raised his hand a long time ago. Can we take two? <laughs> okay, let's do Try. two. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Bob Zakiemi. I represent EMF Consulting Limited. Um, I want to thank the convenience of this summit uh, because it's a summit that is looking like avoiding the future chaos in the industry. Uh, basically, um, years ago, this same issue was very prevalent in telecoms. And um, there had to be a sort of government engagement. And it was properly defined because NCC was handling telecoms. As of today, a lot of the tech companies, as portrayed by the last speaker, don't even know who regulates technology in Nigeria. It's Nita on his job. Are they bringing out regulations to propel the future and guide the technology companies right? Are we having right pegs in the right holes in the regulatory industry? Or are we going to use regulations to stiffen technology? That is the big question they should be asking the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just take from what my uh, brother just uh, ended. My name is um, Emmanuel Zeuli. I'm a cybersecurity and uh, governance expert from Ethnos IT Solutions. My question goes to the Softcom rep. He said we should plant technocrats in government spaces. Yes, I agree with that. That we plant technocrats in government spaces. But don't you think currently we have technocrats in the government spaces who frustrate ideologies? Yes, who frustrate ideologies, and uh, how do we really address this issue? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Adewale, I think that question is for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think the question is for you. You, you said technocrats in the... Okay, you mentioned it. Yes, yes, yes I uh, did. Well, um, of, the... of course, I'm happy to defer to Mr. Adewale as well okay. when, when I'm done speaking. So let's hear from you first. Um... I think it's fair to say that, you know, there might be technocrats that have agendas and um, <laughs> want to frustrate. To be honest, a solution is, hmm, this is a bit of a tough one for me, to be I honest. I, I don't think it should be a tough one for you. You can actually say, we actually talked about <laughs> open communication and honesty, so just be honest. Okay. Um, I think that... Getting the right people in the spaces that we want to see them essentially will just entail some kind of 
brave conversations. I think that we would need to, well, I mean, I just speak from my place as somebody that trusts technology and the power of our voices. I think there are avenues for us to communicate how we feel. There are avenues for us to call out things that we don't want to see. Um, but right now, I wouldn't say I have a systemic answer to that question. Does that make sense? I think right now, from the technology side of the table, the technology, the techpreneur side of the table, what we can do is still continue to engage and still continue to use our voices to say this bill, I mean this regulation, I don't understand it, what is happening. Um, I would say that's, that's what I can offer right now as a solution. Mm. But I'm happy to hear from Mr. Diwali as well. <laughs> Mr. Diwali, do you have any contribution to that? So he, he's saying, he's asking that, they are, that we said or we advise that there should be technocrats in the government among, you know, as part of the government. But then he's saying that there might be some technocrats, you know, who might be working to frustrate the efforts of these tech firms and startups. I mean, that's, I don't think that's peculiar to Nigeria. And I think it's too generic uh, because you can find that in any nation because depending on interest. So that will be based on the individual or uh, the, probably the, the method of selection for such technocrats. Uh, I'm not sure there's a very ready answer on how to prevent that. But I can also say maybe when we have more technocrats and more techpreneurs uh, in, in the boardroom where decisions are made, uh, the conversation right now is like, we are, we are doing a lot, we are building those beautiful homes, but we are not so much concerned about the contractor that they've given to, to do the construction of the road that leads to our homes. So we are all doing the many building, and from the architectural landscape of, or blueprint of what you're building, these are very creative and beautiful homes. But what if you never have a good road that leads to the house that you're building. And that's why I keep saying about this thing, arrogance. And I'm particularly saying that because uh, I wish as many people as possible will leave this place also with that, removing that endorsement. And I'm going back to the gentleman uh, sitting over there that said something about somebody creating a business and you're not sure what regulators govern your business then I would say then you are not supposed to be in business in the first place. And the, my question with that, as, as, as frank as it might be, my, my good friend will be, and I'll use a very good example of what we can all relate. Uh, when, when a lady is extremely pretty, you also need to make yourself available for possible uh, people that might, that might love your beauty. And I'm sure a lot of young people here could relate. Uh, without necessarily going precisely to you or in my brother, uh, if I want your phone number, I will on a public space, my wife might be watching, but <laughs> if I want your phone number, I'm not sure I will wait for a very long time. There must be someone that knows that in this room. It's my job to find it. What I'm getting at in all this is, I've seen many small businesses with creative ideas fail. Some of it with my money in there. So it's very personal to me. And the only reason why they are failing, it's not because the ideas are not good enough. It's because they fail to understand some fundamentals that govern some certain things. So if there's a place for you to say 80% of creativity, 20% of you going out to lobby to make sure that this baby does not die, then you need to leave that your beautiful home and go find a woman to do that for you. So if you continue to consider yourself, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the government are there. I'm just saying I've gotten to a place where I understand the DNA of this entity. And I'm saying I can continue to give myself that self-endorsement. But I'm going to be here again next year, 2027, 2024. And I'm going to tell you how frustrating regulators have been and how frustrating policy formations have been. And that's why I'm still here where I am right now. Removing our endorsement is leaving this place.
that realization that there's work that I need to do on my part, the fact that I need to find out who are these entities that I need to talk to, that doesn't mean they will listen. But that might mean that you've moved the needle from a four to a seven, that the next seven, ten organizations that will come after you will have a better conversation with them than you did. So what have you done? You've contributed to that ecosystem for the growth of that industry. It's not going to change one day. My last comment on this also is like, don't forget also that there's a cultural and age difference also that we are dealing with. You can't take that away. The cultural part of it, you can't take that away. Yes. And without any uh, going precisely to the DG's comments, you could hear a little bit of that in terms of some of his remark. And that's why you said, when he said, come to me, you could see like the reaction from the an child. average person <laughs> in there to say, no, in this world, we don't come to you. You meet us, we don't come to you. Exactly. Because that's the realization of the new age, which is the brilliancy of their creativity, the ingenious invention that they brought out, the tenacity that they put into that thing, which they now call a baby. If I've produced this, I haven't labored so much, I will not come to you. You will come to me. Sorry to cut it short. Do you think a union in the tech space will help? If Just like the way we have the set of you know, a group of persons came together and started pushing this, you know, do you think such a thing will help us, you know, in this regulatory, uh, developing a regulatory framework with the government? If it's structured, if it's structured and we're speaking with one voice, uh, the answer to your question, the really answer is like, yes, that will work. My fear around that is there will be silos and sub-unions based on interest. And that's also largely coming from what I still call the cultural and the age difference. Because if that union precisely doesn't represent my own interest and creativity, then I will form the sub-union that I think will push my own agenda. Okay. And it's still going back to the point that we need to do our own part. We need to clearly understand that whichever way you flip this coin, there might be some element of it that will not favor me. An active engagement will make sure that I have 40% that is good for me, and I ride on the wave of that 40% to get to the next stage, and the next question will be, I have a better leverage. There's a reason for the government to listen to me now. That is a very practical, pragmatic way to make some meaningful comment on this, to make some meaningful milestones on this. But don't get me wrong, like I said, I've gotten to that point where it's not so much of how much government can help me, but understanding this ecosystem, how do I navigate this ecosystem, and actively engaging the stakeholders to make sure that this baby doesn't die. Because if he dies, the same regulator doesn't even know I was ever pregnant. And a lot of babies have actually died, all in the name of government is not helping. That's my major message that I think I want to pass in here today. That's self-endorsement. Let's reduce it a little bit and let's get to that table discussing what matters to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. There's no more time for us, but uh, thank you so much. It's been such an enlightening time and I hope that every one of us was carried along throughout that conversation, you know, and it will make a very good basis for us to actually continue engaging the government over and over these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to the moderator and to the panelists. Let's put our hands together for the panelists. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Um, you can always reach out to, you can always reach out to. Okay, I think we need to take a group photograph before you descend the stage. Let's take a group photograph. Representatives from Tech Next. Um, from Ripples, Nigeria, a couple of others. So we take a photograph and here, yeah, here, yeah, on the stage. Um, let's take a photograph, please. Sorry, a photograph and then a group photograph and then we, we go. Thank you.
within the tech ecosystem. So for those of you looking to reach out to key regulators um, in the public sector, looking to reach out to strategic investors in the tech ecosystem, you can reach out to the GAT Summit. We'll provide answers as best as possible. We'll provide access as best as possible. So this isn't just another forum to talk and then afterwards everything dies. We want to create a very sustainable um, platform where we can maintain and sustain the engagement and create access to solutions that the industry needs. Um, so without much ado, we're going to have a, I think about a three to five minute presentation by our headline sponsor, Stellar's Digital Bank, after which we'll take the vote of thanks and we'll be done. So I want to thank everyone for being so patient, being so cooperative, being so attentive and for making this a very, very robust summit, a re robust engagement. So I'm going to invite the representative from um, Stellar's Digital Bank, and I think we have um, a multimedia presentation, and this is going to take about two to three to five minutes, and then we'll take the vote of thanks from the representative from Ripples Nigeria, one of the organizers of today's event, and that will be it for the day. Thank you very, very much. Please, um, pretty fast, let's just um, up the pace and get this done. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, it's, I've had a great time um, here. I mean, a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, I think I've learned a lot while um, listening to the speakers today. Okay, um, so my name is Jerry. I'm the product lead for Stellar's Digital Bank. Yeah, I know you're saying in your mind, ah, not another digital bank now. I mean, Jerry, we have enough options to send money or pay bills. Yeah, well, so I think I had a friend who made the same statement uh, a couple of months back, but uh, right now she's like an advocate for Stellar's. I mean, giving us free marketing. Don't worry, I'll get to that story in a bit. Um, but for us as tellers, um, simplicity and um, efficiency is the core of our culture, right? So we, what we try to do is make sure we solve real problems, right? And do it in a very simple way and make sure it's efficient. Um, so that's why to, I mean, you can even see it in our, from our designs, right? Down to our implementations and even to our customer relations. Right, um, so for us, right, our customers will say we're not just a digital bank, right, we are their financial partners. Right, um, another key thing we do at um, Stellar's is innovation. So one thing we are really, we really push hard at is uh, innovative banking. And um, in order to do this, it only makes sense that we engage our customers a lot. And um, due to this, we've been able to come up with um, a unique feature, which we, I'm sure a lot of us might, might have seen uh, Stellar stand outside and you see ghost mode, right? Uh, okay, so that story, I'll, I'll give you the story now. So when we launched, we launched early this year in February, February 10th, that was the official date of our launch, right? And um, after we launched, I reached out to a couple of my friends. I was like, oh, hey, I'd like you to try out this app um, I worked on, right? Um, so I had this one friend. She was like, oh, no, Jay, I won't um, install this app and I won't register. Like, oh, I have a lot of accounts, a lot of bank accounts, and I don't need another bank account. And I said, oh, okay, no problem, that's cool. I mean, a couple of weeks back, she reached out to me and said, uh, Jerry, so there's this family I want to, um, that's been struggling for a while, and I think I, I want to send them some money, but I don't want them to know who, who sending them the money because I really just want to keep that private. And she was like, okay, I said, okay, cool, what do you want from me? She said, okay, can I send the money to you to send it to them so they don't know who sends them the money? And I was like, uh, Stellar's already has a solution for you. And she was like, oh, no, 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 Jerry, don't make me install Stellar's. I'm like, we already have a solution for you, right? And it's, it's going to take you up to 10 minutes to complete the sign up and send that money and keep your um, identity anonymous. And right there on the call, she installed the app. OK, no, before she installed it, I actually sent her like, money to just for her to see. And she was like, oh, actually, this works, right? And, I sent, and then she installed the app, right, and then sent the money. And all this happened within, without exaggeration, uh, say around seven minutes. She was able to complete her registration, um, fund the account, and send money, right? And 
just uh, recently, she was like, oh, Jerry, I think you guys need to pay me because I, I recently just onboarded like a couple of people. I mean, the other day she said she uh, onboarded a, an Uber driver, right? And she was able to onboard him while she was in the cab and he actually accepted payments from her, right? And this happened just within a few minutes. I mean, um, that alone, right, just makes me know that, oh, I think this product really works, right? And um, so, um, for uh, a sponsorship, right, um, in order to say thank you for showing up, uh, thank you for staying till the end. We actually have gifts for um, everyone, right, but obviously there's a catch now. So uh, all you need to do is um, install the app, um, complete registration, trust me, it's quite simple, it's very, very simple, right, complete registration and um, fund your account. Once you do that, we have our stand outside and we're ready to interact with you and um, give you as much um, information as you need. Um, in addition to Stellas, we also have a third party um, website that's Interstellas, basically for other developers uh, like us to who would like to consume our APIs for every um, feature or every, every solution we have on Stellas. We also have on Interstellas. So if you're a developer or if you're um, especially if and into financial technology, right? We have solutions for you. Um, you don't have to go. And I mean, our body process is quite easy, right? It's very straightforward. Within a day, you're done with integration. We've approved your account, and you can start um, consuming our APIs. Um, thank you very much again. Once again, I'm Jerry. Stella team and I will be looking forward to meet with you outside. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jerry. Let's put our hands together for them, please. So quickly, I'm going to invite um, Etagene Edirin. He's the editor of Ripples Nigeria. Ripples Nigeria is a co-organizer of today's event. So just for the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. My name is Chinedu Chidi, and I thank you everyone for being here and for being a very, very responsible participant. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chinedu. Uh, I guess my job is almost done here. It's just to thank everybody who has been a part of this. We want to especially thank Mr. Alake, who represented the governor of Lagos State, His Excellency Baba Jide Sonwoyu. We also want to especially thank the NITDA DG, Madam Abdullahi, though they're not here. And I want to thank the participants, the, especially the panelists. The, they did so well, did so much justice to the topics and the titles, and I want to thank every single person in this auditorium for being part of this epoch-making event. We're hoping it won't end here. We're hoping that the reports, discussions, suggestions, insights that were made here today will go a very long way in changing the way the regulators and the stakeholders in the industry will interact with themselves and we have a better tech industry in Nigeria. I want to thank every single person that has been part of this and I say I wish you all a successful journey back to your respective places of abode. Thank you so much everybody. Um, sorry before you go, uh, I just have to say this. Uh, on Nigeria Info 99.3, we have a tech program, tech focus program um, called Digital Life, where we have conversations like this. I know a lot of persons have questions, a lot of persons want to banter, a lot of persons want to express themselves. But you see, um, most times these officials tend to run away. And on the show, we bring these people there and we have these conversations straight up. Just like what you have when we talk about hard facts. That's exactly what we do, but we do it in a tech-focused way. We talk about things on tech. So you can listen to us every Sunday, um, 11 a.m. to 12 noon on Sundays, 11 a.m. to 12 noon, where we have this conversation. It's a calling program, so we'll talk about technology, we'll talk about innovation, indigenous innovation. It's called Digital Life. So, I will want you all to tune in, to participate, and to air your views on that same program. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.